Coming to you from the TLD studios in Temecula, California, it's the Whiskey Throttle Show, taking you deep inside the lives of the legends and leaders of our sport. This week's guest is brought to you by Yamaha, the leaders in the power sports industry. Motocross bikes, street bikes, adventure bikes, side-by-sides, quads, boats, generators. Yamaha sets the standard. Yamaha revs your heart. Method Race Wheels, the strongest, lightest, fastest wheels in off-road. Method dominates the off-road market with wheels for your truck, sprinter, Jeep, or UTV. Go to methodracewheels.com forward slash whiskey throttle for 20% off your order. Troy Lee Designs. Built for the world's fastest racers, TLD blends elite level protection with industry leading style and performance. Moto, bike, helmet paint, casual wear, whatever your passion, Troy Lee Designs is waiting for you on the next level. Nihilo Concepts enhance your riding experience with superior products like the Start Stop Conversion Kit, Fuel Pet Cox, Frame Grip Tape, Lever Grip, Grip Donuts, Secondary On Switch, Billet Foot Pegs billet throttle housings, and so much more. The Hilo Concepts produces exceptional products, all of which are made right here in America. And by SKDA. SKDA is the ultimate destination for exceptional motocross graphics, customer service, and artistic excellence. Trust them to elevate your ride and showcase your individuality on the track, making every ride an exceptional experience. Hey everybody, thanks for joining us here at the Whiskey Throttle Show. I'm your host, David Pingree, and today we've got a fun guest, a longtime buddy of mine, an old teammate, and a guy with some great hair and some of the best whips in the game, Supercross winner, Mr. Billy Leninovich. Thanks for coming on, buddy. Thank you, Ping. I'm excited. Yeah, stoked to have you. I, You know, it's funny because you, you've you always been on my list of guys to have on, and then I went a long time kind of without seeing you. I disappeared for a while. Yeah, you were like eight years. man in the woods. I don't know what happened to you. When I became an electrician. Oh, did you really? Uh huh. I that was a normal life. Is that what your dad did, or how'd you get into that? No, my dad was, um, he did heavy equipment. Oh, okay. and my brother. Okay. Um, I was just, I was coaching after I was done racing. And honestly, I was just sick of riding dirt bikes. I didn't want to look at them no more. And I was doing good with coaching. I was getting a Toyota from Toyota of Escondido, a dirt bike from Escondido Cycle Center. I just wanted to do something different. Yeah. And so, um, yeah. I was looking up the trades, and I'm like, man, that looks really easy on your body. Not like drywall or concrete. Yeah. And so... It's great until so you get electrocuted. <laughs> yeah. One, that's not easy. That's dangerous, yeah. yeah. You got to use your head. So, as a fireman, like, we get a lot of calls for wires down or electrical issues, and it's the one thing where I'm like, nope, <laughs> flag that shit off and wait for the electricians to come because... Especially the high voltage stuff. Dude, I don't understand it. Yeah. I don't... And, it, and what I don't understand, I'm like, I'm out. <laughs> yeah. Call the front. <laughs> so I have... Get yourself a hot stick. So you I know. We have stuff like that. Uh-huh. So I appreciate you. <laughs> so you... Did you work as an electrician for a while then? Yeah, I did it for six years. And? What? Yeah. It was it was good. I learned a lot. It's good money too, yeah? Yeah. So if I need some electrical work, <laughs> can I call you? Yep. <laughs> I'm going. God, this show is worth it already. Yeah. So excited. Yeah. Well, um, I saw you. This We'll just use this as our Method Race Wheels front-end chatter. This is how we get our shows started. Uh, they bring you the lightest, strongest, fastest wheels uh, in the game. If you guys are looking for uh, uh, wheels for your truck, van, sprinter, UTV, whatever, uh, go to methodracewheels.com forward slash whiskey throttle. Punch your name in there. They'll send you a code for 20% off. Uh, we have been a big uh, supporter of Method and vice versa for a long time. So really since we started, which is awesome. So appreciate them. Um, you recently got back into riding though. And so yeah. this is, we bumped into, into each other at the track, but I saw you in a video, like a dual sport mm-hmm. out at Verona ripping. Yeah. My buddy called and said, Hey, there's a dual sport race at Verona this weekend. And I'm like, that sounds fun, but I don't have a dual sport. He goes, I have one. All right, I'll come race it. So that was my first race in 11 years. I loved it because you're in like old gear. <laughs> it's probably all you have, right? It is. And you're out there throwing whips on this <laughs> street legal bike. Oh, it was so much fun. And then this weekend I did a SAR or SRA? SRA? SRA Grand Prix yeah. night race, which was sketchy. I've never ridden in the night or anything like that. So when you're going off the jumps, you're going up. And unless your front end's down, you can't see where you're landing. Oh. So you're just landing in the dark. And- Glenn Helen or where were you? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, I never thought of that. When you jump, you're yeah, you're pointed up for at least a minute. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was fun though. Got to get some handy moves going. Drop the front end. You do <laughs> really? Yeah. And I got in. I probably half a lap in practice. I didn't do the whole lap. So where we pitted, I came in, and so my first lap, I was totally blind. Didn't know the track or anything. But by the second one, it was. I was able to start moving a little bit. Pretty fun though, right? Not different. It's Just, rough, dude. Yeah. I ate at the yeah. first lap at practice. There's some guys in front of me. It was kind of muddy and there's a long straightaway and I'm just on the gas trying to pass this guy. And then it kind of went uphill and I hit a rock underneath the sand Oh, and just washed the front end out just straight on my head and my shoulder. I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> Is that why you're missing some skin here? Yep. Right there. <laughs> I'm really lucky I didn't hurt my shoulder because I hit hard. Really? Yeah. But it's fun. It's sandy and rough, rocky. Yeah. And so are, are you, now that you rode again after taking that time off, do you, yeah. did it kind of like reignite your love for it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I'm so excited. That's cool. That's a fun place to be. So in that eight year period, I was doing electrical. I probably rode maybe 12 times. Okay. In that whole time. And then I've ridden probably eight times in the last month so not a whole lot of time on the bike yeah yeah you don't forget how to ride them no that's the cool thing is it it comes right back you just got to build some calluses up and i know get the soreness yeah the soreness <laughs> i got the worst arm pump on that race at barone on the dual sport you did i was probably 20 or 30 seconds ahead and you know racing is totally different when you yeah. practice my arms are locked up. My hands are cramped up. I'm trying to breathe and relax. And I'm so far out front. I'm like, man, such a big difference than just riding at the tracks. It's totally different. Totally different. Well, I love to see you back, buddy. Thank you. Um, well, that's our Method Race Wheels front end chatter. Get over to whiskeythrottlemedia.com. We've got all kinds of stuff. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, uh, our social media pages, uh, lots of stuff. There's a forum there. We got merch. We got all kinds of stuff. So um, check it out. Our guests... His story today is brought to you by Yamaha. Let's get to it. Tell me a little bit about where you grew up. Ramona? Yeah, I was born in Poway. Poway, okay. Yeah, San Diego. And then we lived in Alpine for a little bit and then moved to Ramona when I was about eight or nine years old. Okay. So this is what we call East County San Diego, right? Yep. And this was like the Cajon Zone. This, nope. It's got some moto history. Absolutely. There's a lot of guys that came out of that area. Yeah. Yeah. Um. What was it like there growing up? You guys have like open area to ride and stuff? Um, so my dad had probably, or my parents, a acre or two. Okay. And so we had a little track in our backyard when I was eight or nine years old. Um, my dad made a couple doubles, super steep, and he made it all rutted and big old kickers and stuff. So I would get comfortable hitting these kickers. And it was sketchy. Like there's a big old hole at the top of it. So if you weren't paying attention, burr. Really? Dad's like trying to set you up. Yeah. <laughs> they just wanted me to learn bike control. Yeah. So at uh, eight, nine years old, I'm hitting these on 80s. Jeez. What did you do before you got a bike? Were you in any other sports? Do you have any selling? Yes. I have two sisters and a brother. I'm the oldest. You're the oldest. Okay. Yeah. Um, I played football a little bit when I was younger, but I didn't want to do any other sport. I just no. wanted to ride my motorcycle. Once you got a bike, that was it. Yeah. So- I started riding when I was two and a half on a little YZ Zinger three-wheeler. And then I think I was seven when I started riding a two-wheeler. Okay. And that was my first race, 1990 at Bruno. The Tri-Zinger. Tri-Zinger. Yeah. Was it yep. blue? Um, I don't remember. Okay. And I don't think so. Okay. Yeah. That's Tri-Zinger. Yep. Those were <laughs> two and a half years old. It was fun. <laughs> um. So how did, you, that was your first bike ever or? Yep. Motorized. Yep. Can't really call it a bike, but. Yep. Um, so you guys just rode for fun, it sounds like, for a while. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So my dad, how I got into it, my dad wanted to race professionally. He was a pretty good rider. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. But my grandma hated it. And so she would never support him or anything like that mm -hmm. by bikes or anything. So when he got old enough, he bought a bike and just go race for fun, go to Barona and stuff like that. Hmm. So that's how I got into okay. to riding. So he was a pretty good rider. So he helped you a lot with technique and stuff early on. Yeah. 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 No, he was a good rider. He'd go out to Glamis and jump 150-foot doom-to-doom jumps. Yeah. Big jumps. Mm. 
He's hurting now for it, but is he? Yeah, he's all banged up. But yeah, he was a good rider. That's awesome. That's I I feel like that helps. You know, like my dad didn't. He rode, but he didn't race at all. So he mm-hmm. he didn't. He, you know, what do you offer, right? Like other than just go ride, go ride. Yeah, yeah. It's nice that when your parents have a little bit of foundation. Yeah, they can go. Hey, you need to get your elbows up, or yeah, you know, you're sitting too much or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um. So when did you guys get into racing? 1990, my first race was Brunt Oaks. My dad took me out there. I was on a CR60, and I think it was, remember the mini nationals? Yeah. That they used to have? I think yeah. it was a mini nationals. So my first race- Wait, 1980? 90. Oh, 1990. Okay. Yeah, there was, um, Barone used to have a Transcal. I remember going in 88. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was big down there. I don't know if they had a Golden State. And then they have the mini nationals, which is their big event. CMMC, right? CMMC. Yeah. yeah. Huge event. So yeah. many prizes. The winners would get scooters, like big scooters, motorized scooters. Yeah. Mountain bikes. Do you know what I won there? Um, what was the little Yamaha, like a miniature street bike? YSR? Huh? YSR 50? <laughs> yeah. I won one there. Did you? Yeah. At that race. They had good prizes back then. I, I And then I just, I'm back to Scottsdale and try to ride it to my girlfriend's house on the street. <laughs> got, got pulled over. <laughs> you got pulled over. <laughs> I had to walk it home. Uh, that's funny. Uh, that is funny. Yeah. The cop was actually cool to let me go. He's like, shut it off, walk it home. Yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> that's like stupid. I, you get in a lot of trouble. Now. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so who did you, who did you, who was like your crew when you guys down there in, in 1990 as you guys started? Like was, Trying to think of who was in that area. Chris Wheeler, were they older? Or that yeah, was safe? They were a little bit older. Chris Wheeler, Dustin Nelson, Dustin Nelson. Andy Harrington, uh, Josh Tarantino. Those were the guys that I had looked up to. After. Okay. They were like faster yeah. one one year. Okay. Cause they were kind of my era. So I'm trying to think yeah. of who you grew up with. So John Hopkins, road racer. Okay. Really? Um, yep. Oh, I didn't know that. John Hopkins. Uh grew up racing with him. Hopper. Yep. We lived in the same town in Ramona. Um, but at that time, Jesse Casillas okay. grew up yeah. racing. But other than that, I don't remember who I raced with mm. that young, yeah, at that age. And and were you guys just kind of local racing? I mean, did you guys travel oh, yeah. how much? I rode from 1990 till I believe my first national was 97. Okay. So seven years, it was just Verona. No, literally just brought it. Just, okay. Yeah. From 1990 to probably 96 or 97. Maybe 96. My dad started taking me to Paris and Glen Helen. Okay. And stuff. But yeah, it was just ride for fun. Okay. Mm-hmm. And then what was the catalyst to kind of, did you start it? Obviously you were winning everything. So he's like, oh, let's go see how we do here and there. Um, No, I wasn't winning everything. Mm. I was more worried about showing off and throwing whips and ah. yeah, doing knack knacks and <laughs> no footers and stuff over the jumps. So I would be like, well, there was the McGrath era. So yes. Then I got some photos to show you too, doing knack knacks on eighties. But, um, yeah, we just, uh, riding for fun. My dad's like, Billy, you got to go win. You got to quit showing off. And I'm like, dad, I'm having fun. now." <laughs> so it was all fun until there. And I had to have been 13 or 14 before I went to my first national. Okay. And that was at world minis. I believe in 97. A garbage track in Vegas. In Vegas. So. Yep. They had the big old pit for the wind. And How did it go? Uh, I ended up seventh. Oh, really? Okay. First one. Yeah. Like 125. LB. 14. Um, no. Mini bikes. Mini bikes. Yeah. Okay. I was on 80s. Okay. Yep. Yeah. I finished seventh. And then my dad's like, well, maybe we can pursue this. And so then what else? I'm trying to think late 90s, like what else would have been, was the Texas, the GNC National still going? Or? Whitney. Yeah, Lake Whitney. Lake Whitney. Mammoth. Mammoth. Yeah. What What other big ones were you doing? Um, I believe that was, maybe I did Lake Whitney that year too. I think I went out there, um, Dayton Beavers and his family. So we did World Minis. It's either 98 or 97. Then we went to um, Lake Whitney. I think I finished fourth in the 80 class or super mini class or something like that. And who would be winning? Was that like- Ryan Marias, Buckaloo, or- Justin was older. Oh, he was a little bit older than me. 
he was such a good amateur rider. Yeah. Man, so fast. And I was a little bit younger than him, so I was always at his pit hanging out and <laughs> watching. Uh -huh. Yeah. He always had his little deal on his arm because he always battled arm pump. Always. Been on 80s. Yeah. And so he's always massaging his arms out and stuff. But Ryan Morris was competitive. I think Colt Humphreys, um, Jesse Casillas, hmm, a few other guys. Okay, it's hard to remember the yeah that long, that far back. So, what, was there like a point where you started winning at the amateur national level? Um, I didn't really start winning until I got um to one twenty five B was my first title. Okay. So we did a couple a couple um nationals on the super minis. Uh nineteen ninety eight I did US Open Supercross. I won the first night. Okay. And then I was running third, thought I had to pass for second to win the overall and came out of the corner and over the finish line I was checkered flag and I jumped I was going off the track into the hay bills. So I jumped off the bike and ended up breaking my leg. Uh, but I got the overall at US Open. And then from there, um, Yamaha started sponsoring me and, and giving me bikes. And before that, were you ECC or something? Or I remember you being... No. Oh, nothing. We just, yeah. yeah we just, rode old bikes, maybe two two years old, older and never had new bikes or anything. Mm. Yeah. Actually, the, the Swift family, Burger King, if you ever noticed on my helmets when I was an amateur... I believe right before U.S. Open, they had bought me a brand new 80 hmm. and helped us out because we always had old bikes. Chucky bikes. Yeah, my dad never had the money to go buy new bikes or they're always stock. Hmm. All my bikes were stock. and Huh. Yeah. That's cool. So what year was that with the U.S. Open? 1998. 98. Okay. Yep. Um, and how about those early days? Like, Do you have good memories of those amateur years? I remember the U.S. Open. I won the, the first night, and then I got to come down in the ball. And I believe it was Kyle Lewis that came down. McGrath had won the second night, or the first night, and, but he was scared to come down in the ball. He didn't want to get booed. Because Ricky, no, not booed. He was just scared to come down because this oh. ball is probably 100 feet up in the air, maybe. Oh, It was a big old ball, and they would drop you down, and we walk out, jump on our bikes, and do a lap. And he was scared to get in that ball. So I believe Kyle Lewis was on his gear or had his gear on and everything. No, jumped on the bike, did a half a lap, went in the back, and then McGrath came out the other section to talk in front of everybody and do the interview and stuff. Yeah. That's yeah. interesting. I didn't know that. Well, I don't blame him. I don't like heights either. I'm the same way. Yeah, we <laughs> ride dirt bikes and jump in. <laughs> so who, what pro guys did you look up to as a kid? Uh, Mike Craig. Mm. He was a Bruno local guy. I was always there hanging out with him. Um, but earlier, Ricky Johnson and David Bailey were my those were your guys. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. your well, I don't know if this was your breakout year as an amateur. You said ninety, ninety eight, ninety eight, ninety nine. You started winning some stuff, mm -hmm. but you won a Loretta's title in two thousand. Yep. And that was the first year you went to Loretta's, right? Mm, no, I went to the. I went to. Oh, you went ninety eight also. Okay. Ninety eight. Yeah. And you got a third. So you were you were competitive even back then. I got a third. Yeah. What, Super Mini? Uh, 85, 14 to 15 stock in 98. You got a third. Uh, the next year, you got a fourth and a fifth, and then you went 111 on a 125. Yep. I forgot about that stuff. So, yeah, good finishes. Yep. Podiums and, and one title. Yep. Um, Was there, at what point, obviously in that 2000 season, you had to have some team's attention where they start talking? 2000? Mm-hmm. Coming through, um, Yeah. So I had a lot of support from Yamaha. Um, I had Shamont Banks, this guy that sponsored us. He bought us, I think, six bikes also. So Yamaha gave us six bikes. And then he bought us, Was we had 12 bikes lined up in the garage. Jeez. Yeah. So we had a lot of support in that era. Um, in 2000, 99, 2000. Um, yeah, it was just Yamaha. Hmm. Giving us the support. And who who were you racing against at Lira in that like two thousand season? Ryan Ryan Marias was a really tough competitor as an amateur. Um Chase Reed, I believe. 
Okay. Chase Reed was there. He was a really good amateur. Johnny Marley. They were a little bit older, but I think they were still racing in those classes. Okay. Um, Jonathan Shimp. Yeah. He was a tough guy. He was a guy. Yeah. Man. Okay. All these guys just, most of them just didn't ever make it in, huh? Mm -hmm. They were fast local kids. They were fast amateurs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was the difference is you get guys that are really fast local riders, but then you get to Loretta's and their 10th, mm -hmm. 15th place, you know, or they even do good at Loretta's too. But as soon as they turn pro, that's just the pressure. Yeah. The pressure gets to them. It's different, right? I mean, mm -hmm. you can... I mean, anywhere, and I still find this, anywhere you go, there's a local kid who hauls ass. Yeah. And you could suit up and he'll whip you, whip yeah. your butt. But you go somewhere where there's a lot of other competition, yeah. a big amateur event or a big pro race. And man, yeah. it changes people. It does. Yeah. Look at Canada. Did you ever go race in Canada? Mm -mm. Dude, the they are so fast up there. Yeah, I know. Uh, and then they come down south and all of a sudden- Twenty. It's like Superman with a <laughs> got some <laughs> kryptonite in his pants. Well, it's even like going to Europe and doing Bercy Supercross, yeah, and stuff. Like some of those Europeans yeah. are so fast, and then they come out here to race Supercross and struggle. They might make it into a main event, maybe. Yeah. Well, even I mean, yeah, Vial. Like we have these world champions. I I thought Vial he'd be winning. Yeah, and I know it's a it's a learning curve, but it's just different. Yeah, and you go somewhere totally. different. Yeah, it affects you mentally. Yeah, yeah. It's even hard to, for us to go to Europe and race. Yes. Just seeing a different country and everything's different. It's hard. Warm milk. Oh, gosh. Runny egg. Worst. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hard boiled eggs that are runny. <laughs> I'm always asking for ice for the milk. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, okay. So, what did you do in 2001? Still like amateur A? Yep. That's right. when I went A. Um, so, yeah, like we talked about, um, Got some decent finishes on the 80s, and then 2001, I believe, is when I turned A, and that's when I started winning. I, the year before, I think I won at Mammoth in 125B, and then I won a title at Loretta's, and then 2000, I went A. Um, had a really good season there. Um, I think I won three out of four at Lake Whitney. Uh -huh. Or not Lake Whitney, World Minis. I won the 125, 250 Pro Class at Lake Whitney. And then right before Loretta's, I was testing for Factor Suzuki on the Suzuki trap. And they didn't water the trap. And there was a big old triple. And I'm, I felt like such a squid for not jumping this jump. So I go for it. It was a little double. And I just wheel spun all the way up. And I framed it. Barely got my front wheel over it cased it over the bars, broke my arm, sprained my other one really bad. And afterwards they're like, man, I can't believe you guys, or you jumped this thing. And I'm like, what do you mean? Like the guys only do it if it's watered and super tacky. I'm like, well, <laughs> thanks for telling me. I'm like, I'm thinking you guys are looking at me bad for not <laughs> jumping this triple. And yeah, just wheel spin all the way up at you. Mm -hmm. So then I missed my A year at Loretta's. Okay. I was wondering why you didn't show up. Yeah. So... You had some options then coming into 2002, obviously. Yeah. Um, you said you even had a Yamaha of Troy offer. Like, what, what offers did you have? You had Suzuki, obviously, if you were testing with them. So Pro Circuit, uh, I had an offer from Pro Circuit. I had an offer from Factory Connection Honda. Um, I had a Yamaha Troy. And then maybe, I don't know if FMF Honda was there at that time. They were there. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe then. But mainly all, yeah, all the main. So basically every good factory team. Yeah. Coming in. Um, and you ended up signing with KTM. Yep. Uh, we were teammates there your rookie year, which I kind of had forgotten that was your rookie season. Mm -hmm. um, tell me, tell me why you made that decision. Well, I think. Pro because State. KTM was very new still. Yes, very new. And. 2001 was really their first full effort here. They did have a team in 2000, but it was pretty rinky-dink. They tried harder in 2001. 2002, they brought on Kurt Nickel, Ron Heben. They had a a pretty good yeah. effort. Yeah. But, new, but, you know, still very, very young. Yeah. Yeah, so I think Cowie offered me 25000 
Yamaha Troy offered me 40. Um, I can't remember the other ones, but, um, KTM offered me $75,000 and, and then we had a really good friend there, Scott Harden. He was really pushing for us to go to the KTM. I think Langston had just won the GP title that year, or the year before. 2000. Yeah. And then he almost won the 2001 outdoor outdoors. And yeah. So we went for money hmm. for the 75,000, which I regret. Big time. Um, I really wish I wouldn't. I would have went to Yamaha and Troy. Those bikes were so good. And I think so good. My career would have started off totally different. The KTM, you could be competitive. Like we were talking earlier, I'm the type of person. If I'm not comfortable on the bike, I could be two, three seconds a lap off, and you know, that's a lot of time. You know, Supercross and outdoors and stuff. But um, yeah, we well, struggled really bad in the whoops. Everywhere was pretty good. That bike was fast. Yeah. We had the fastest bikes. They didn't bog, I don't remember, too much. Kind of like PC. No, we, we didn't have really a big issue with that. Uh, Harry Nolte, who did our motors, was still is an, a, a living legend in, in Europe, tuning bikes. And um, he and Mitch work closely together. They're very, very high level engine builders and tuners. And so the thing was fast, it ran clean, but it had no linkage. And so in 2002, when you came on, we went to bigger forks that helped the front end. But at the end of the day, if you're trying to do all of your, you know, control of your rear end with valving, you don't have the, the constant of a progressive linkage. You know, it, it's like a give and take. And um, if you got it firm enough to where it wouldn't bottom out on landings or G outs, well, then it just skip it. It would just slide on the whoops. You couldn't get it to like bite on that initial part. And I remember that was always our challenge. And I'm like, well, just make it work in the jumps, the sketchy stuff, and I'll figure the whoops out. That was kind of what I had to do. Yep. And so like uh, it would work okay when there was traction, you remember? Mm -hmm. But like Vegas or Dallas, hang on, <laughs> hang on. We get we skim the first half of the whoops, and then the front end would just drop, and then you see yeah. us jumping through the whoops. And Langston got the worst of it when he moved up to that 250 because it was even worse. McGrath too. Yeah, McGrath too. When he tried to race that thing. Um, yeah, it was just, they were just so early in their development. Um, if you had gone to Yamaha, like you said, that comfort, that was what was missing in the bike is just trusting it. Exactly. Um, and those Yamaha Troy bikes were so good. They were so good. Yeah. But mm. two weeks before my first Supercross, um, I had torn my ACL. So we were up at Castillo Ranch and... Did, bike didn't bog that much, but this time it did. Mm -hmm. It was a little double into a triple and bike bowl uh -huh, and just looped me out, jumped off the bike, tore my ACL, bruised both my heels. So then I'm going into my first race with a torn ACL, bruised heels. I think I may have ridden the day before, maybe two days before that supercross. Mm -hmm. Well, I was wondering why, because your first race was Anaheim 2 in 2000. So we already had Anaheim 1, San Diego. And then back to A2. So that's what happened. Yeah. Okay. Well, I raced, but I just didn't qualify for uh, a few okay. events. I got you. And back then, if you had, if you weren't in top 10, you had to do the day qualifiers. Mm -hmm. So you had to go race. And that was gnarly. It was gnarly. That was super gnarly. One first turn crash and then we just done. Yeah. Yeah. So first one, I don't know where I finished, but second round, I got a bad start. And I actually rode really good, and I think I missed it by a couple spots to get into the night program and stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I missed my first two main events. So, what do you remember from A two that year? Your first main event, like what stands out from that day? The pressure, the pressure, just sitting in the rig, getting your gear on before the night program. It's it was gnarly, mm -hmm. and I don't remember having that pressure as an amateur, like. It's another level when you... Oh, it's a uh, whole another level. Yeah. Yeah, that pressure that these guys have on them racing, especially when you're going for a title or something like that, it's unbelievable. Yeah. I This was a big part of the reason where when I knew it was time for me to retire was I couldn't... Like that pressure turned turned into like I was miserable. Like, what am I doing? Yeah. I don't enjoy this. Yeah. This isn't fun anymore. I want, I, I want to be done. Yeah. Do you remember getting to a point where you're like, yeah, yeah. I hated racing. 
hated it. But it wasn't the pressure from the team. I think it was more on me doing it. Yeah, but it's a collection of all of it, right? Like, it is. You want to do well for yourself. Yes. You know your mechanic has worked his butt off. The team has spent all this money. Your suspension guys put all these hours in. Your dad is, you know, it's just everything. You, you feel a sense of responsibility to perform yeah. for all of them. And they're paying you to go win. Yeah. Not go get top 10, not make a main event. You're there to win or podium. <laughs> yeah. 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 I hated racing. I think people have a hard time grasping that. They just think, oh, and I don't know, at the end of the day, maybe we are spoiled. It beats digging ditches or beat a hot trojan. I don't know. You no. tell me, <laughs> right? Like it's hard work. It is um, very hard work, but it's also not all fun and games. You know, it's just all riding a dirt bike for your living. No, it's, there's a lot of pressure. Yep. You can get jacked up every single time you throw a leg over the bike. Yep. There's that pressure, you know, like. That's the biggest thing. Like probably halfway into my career is when I started figuring out how to control that how to control your nerves and the pressure, you know? I think all that pressure came from, like, I hated starts for, for, with the passion. Oh, really? Hated it. Didn't want to get in a first-turn pileup. So as I'm getting ready in the truck, I'm thinking about getting in a first-turn pileup, getting landed on, getting paralyzed, just getting hurt, mm. you know? Mm -hmm. A lot of the pressure comes from that. Yeah. And so maybe four years into my career, I'm like, man, I got to start focusing on what I can control, not what I can't control. I can't control getting in a first turn pile up. Yeah. I can control my reaction time on the start. I can control my clutch release, being aggressive, all that stuff, you know? Mm. And that definitely helped. Mm. Once I started thinking more correctly, then a little less pressure. And it's just controlling the controlling that pressure, you know, the nerves and stuff. Using it yeah. for your advantage. Yeah, it's it's on everybody. It's how do you deal with it. Yep. Uh, and and that's something I, it took me a while to figure out too. And I got to a place I just went, okay, I could get hurt. Uh, I even went so far as to go, okay, if I got paralyzed, what would I do? Uh, I'll go live at my folks. I'll sell boats. I'll do you know I'll do whatever, and I, mm -hmm. I'll just okay. And I just made peace with it. And then and then I didn't think about it anymore. Yep. And like as demented as that sounds, yeah. You have to. Everybody, you have to come up with a way. Yeah. You know, like, I don't know what worked for you, but it's like, you got to figure out a way to talk it through and then go, okay, and put it in a box. Yeah. It's tough. It's very tough. Yeah. A lot of guys racing get hurt and yeah, it's very scary. And this is why we talk about you, the, the Jonathan Shimps, the Johnny Marleys. Man, these are really fast, talented kids. And we could go on for yeah a weeks listing these kids yeah. that just don't make that step up. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of it has to do with the pressure. Mouse McCoy, you know, like these are kids that I looked up to when I was a little kid who were, he's going to be the next Bob Hanna. This kid's like the next thing. Nope. Didn't like the pressure and you don't ever know. It's, it's crazy. It's like nowadays, I don't know why, but if the kids are pretty dominant as amateurs, they come in and they're doing good. Like a Deegan. Um, yeah. I, I think the pressure just starts earlier because they're factory and they're expected yeah. to go to the, there's more pressure to win early. So I think they're weeded out early. Yeah. You can't handle pressure. They're going to find out, you know, early. at Loretta's yeah. years and years earlier. Yeah. We're like at our era, there wasn't a lot of manufacturer pressure at Loretta's. Yeah. Right. It was probably just you and your dad. Like, yeah, you wanted to do well, but it was pressure you put on yourself where now I think the factories are going, okay. You have a full work race bike going to Loretta's. You, yeah. you need to win. You think it could be the bikes too? 125, 252 strokes are way harder to ride. You know, you actually had to have some skills to ride those bikes. Yeah, well, they were a lot harder to ride. People don't think that, but they were a lot harder to ride. You didn't have very many amateur kids come in and dominate. You had Stuart, Carmichael. You had a few kids come in. Now you yeah. seem like these kids are on the podium right away doing good. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I agree. It's just, I don't know that I love the way it is right now. With the bikes are just so fast. So the speed so fast. I mean, compared to riding a 125. Well, even in our days, like, because when you came in, the tracks were still pretty technical and tight and slower. Yeah. And now they, it's like they've rounded things off and everything just, just a faster flow. Yeah. I'm like, man, when they get off, they're going 15 miles an hour faster. Well, you just hit the dirt that much harder. Yeah. So... Um, 
I wanted to ask you this because I bumped into Rhino the other day and I was, when I went, when I was a rookie, he was my teammate and I was, we were talking about, um, I, I forget how it came up, but I just said, you were an asshole. Like <laughs> I didn't know anything. And I'm like, Hey Rhino, you know, what should I do? How many laps should I ride? Do I, should I do, what should I do? And you're like, I don't know, kid, go figure it out. Like he did not help me at all. Yeah. And I always was like, gosh, Rhino's kind of a dick. But uh, looking back, he was a title contender. So he was just focused on what he was doing. And, you know, I get it. Was I a dick to you in 2002? Like, did I no. come off that way? I was okay. good. You okay. and Brock? Remember you, okay. Brock? Good. Yeah, oh, yeah. No, you guys were always good to me. Okay. I just wanted to make sure because I'm thinking, man, I was. those were years I was pretty focused on what I was doing. I hope I didn't ever, like... I hold a grudge pretty good if someone wears me the wrong way. <laughs> so we probably wouldn't be friends if you did. <laughs> okay. Well, good. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. Um, so what do you what do you remember from that first season? Like, what was kind of your biggest takeaways? Just the pressure and the start. The first season, yeah. So much pressure. Um, just getting the experience, really. You know, um, let my knee heal up, kind of. Well, it sucks coming in hurt, too. Like, what, yeah. That's a terrible way. Yeah, torn ACL, and then you have to go race your first Supercross two weeks later. Um, and then I think by my fifth round, I ended up on the podium. Anaheim three. So it got yeah. a little bit better. Just yeah, that's a few true. races of getting comfortable. In fact, Brock hole shotted and weren't you and I, we were like one, two, three for a minute. I believe so. And then I crashed. Mm -hmm. Cause I crashed in the whoops. I crashed that little dragon's back right after the start. Mm -hmm. Cause my shoulder was hurt. Cause I broke my bike in half the weekend before. <laughs> oh, and I want oh, to ask you about that. About that. Yeah. So this, this, uh, I want to remember what you remember from this because your first race, I actually won. Mm -hmm. We go to Phoenix during that week. They sent us some pistons, right? W tell me if you remember the story, the way I remember being told Austria sent over these lightweight pistons mm -hmm. that worked better on the dyno, but none of us test rode them. I don't think none of us got to test them. No, they just went into our bikes. We went to Phoenix. Mm -hmm. I was the first heat. I don't know which heat you were in. Were you in that first heat? No. Okay. I was on the starting line. Okay. You were first heat. So that's probably why I didn't qualify for my second second race. Because that was second, right? With Anaheim, Phoenix. It went, no, no, no. It went Anaheim, San Diego, Anaheim, Phoenix, Anaheim. Oh, it did? Mm-hmm. That all, I didn't think I qualified for Phoenix. Yeah, I don't know. Well, uh, I can tell you right now. 2002, yeah, you got 15th. Okay. <laughs> well, I was on the starting line. Watching you on the big screen because they had you on the big screen because I was leading last lap. Yeah, my skirt of my piston breaks off on the face of a triple. Lucky me, that was the bike break in half incident. And so I'm screaming at him to get my bike ready because I'm coming back for the LCQ. Doc Bodner's like, "No, you're spitting up blood. You're going to the hospital." I find out later they pulled your you guys went through that second heat. I don't know how you qualified in. I, I wasn't there, but you got you and Brock both made the main. They pulled your bikes apart after the heats, and both of your bikes had cracks in the piston. No. Yeah. Oh, I don't remember that. So they swapped back to the other pistons, obviously. Yeah. I just remember on the starting line watching you, like checking out your lines and everything while you're jumping, and you go off the triple, and this is full. And as soon as you land, those sparks just right off. And I'm like, oh my goodness, I'm sitting here on the same bike. <laughs> <laughs> looking down going yeah um, I'm like oh please lord protect me that doesn't help your comment no it does not <laughs> help at all and it wasn't just your bike I remember we went to Colorado I think to ride and maybe that same year or the year after and there was bikes breaking in half and, uh, yeah. and it was the triple clamps it was something about the rake of the fork or the build up of the yeah. behind the thing anyway yeah, that was ugly. That was Kenny Bartram snapped a couple. Yeah. Yeah. It was not a good time for them. That gets in your head a little bit. A little bit. Just a little. <laughs> when you're flying through the air, go, hmm, I hope this stays together. <laughs> yeah. It's not what you want to be thinking about. <laughs> um, so did you, in, in 2002, you, you only, I feel like you missed a little window. Like I did. did. Okay, what happened? Because so, you, you did uh, all the way up to Daytona, yeah. which you went and rode an East Coast oh, round. Yeah. What was that about? Daytona. That was so brutal. I think I pulled off the track. I felt like such a goon rider that 
I was hitting a triple and then there's just ruts everywhere. I'm jumping off the track, landing, literally hitting the triple, not landing on the landing, landing on the flat on the grass. <laughs> and I'm like, what am I doing? And then I'm watching Langston out there winning or battling, you know, I felt yeah. like such a beginner. But yeah, anyways, I did. So back then you could go race if you were in top 10 in points. Yeah. East Coast. Yeah, yeah. So I did Daytona and then I think it was... Um, St. Louis or New, New Orleans. Okay. A uh, whole shot into the first turn, make a left, and then it was a dragon's back up. Why a whole shot? And they watered it, front end washed out. The bar caught my knee, and then I went up the jump, and so it was like, oh. So I tore my, my ACL was already torn, so then I did my MCL, PCL, and my meniscus. Ooh. Finished it off. Um, so after that, I had surgery. Um. Then I missed the rest of Supercross. I started riding one month after that, after yeah. that surgery. That does, dude, that's insane because you went from March 9th, you raced again in July. That's not enough time to heal what you did. I did it in March. I That was New Orleans. Middle of March, yeah. March, well, May, June, yeah. So, yeah, I had a tube hanging out of my knee, draining all the fluid and blood and everything for maybe a week or two. I start riding one month after that. Um, and you never retore it? Oh, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> We're not done there. I did three ACLs on that knee and then one on my right knee. Okay. Yeah. So did you do that one right away because you started riding so early? No. I oh, no. did it yeah. the following year. Okay. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I had two ACLs in one, so you, you got me beat. Yeah. That's no fun. Does that thing bug you now? It's not too bad. Really? Every once in a while it bugs me, but okay. yeah. My body's pretty good. Huh. Right, most good. guys are messed up. Good for you. Yeah. <laughs> most most racers are messed up, but yeah, my body's good. All right. So you you uh you actually you came back, did Steel City, you got a fifth. Like that's really well, good. Coming back was Washugal, right? That was my first. Yes. Yeah. You at seven, eighteen, seventeen, five. At your last four. That's pretty good, dude. Seventh at Washougal, your first race back is really good. Yeah, I got fourth, the first moto. I think I went 4.11. I don't, yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah. So I got fourth. I was battling with Stuart. And that was a few months after the surgery. Jeez. I think I had maybe two months on the bike or something, right? Okay. So then I, I hired Rhino. I was training with Rhino. Right after I had my knee surgery, I started training with Ryan and we were doing a bunch of cycling. He was actually riding with me and all that stuff. Um, so yeah, my first national, I went out, finished fourth in my first moto. Which was awesome. And that was your first was ever national? So, yeah. 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 Okay. And then second moto, got a bad start or something and finished 11th. Now, if you're scared, if you didn't like starts, the nationals had to be worse then, right? Well, I was always scared to start, but... I was always a good starter. Yeah. And so I wanted to get to that first turn yeah. first. Yeah, yeah. I did not want to go in. First or last, back. right? Full Ricky Bobby, Absolutely. because everywhere in the middle is a nightmare. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I was always a good starter. I was terrified of him, but I always wanted to get in that first turn first. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what you, we talk about, kind of taking that fear and, and turning it into focus. Yes. For good, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. And as a motocross coach now, you can't really teach that. Like you can teach them how to start, but they have to put that effort in to get that start yeah you know and they've got to get there mentally yes to take that fear and instead of being hesitant yes be um purposeful and like going okay i'm gonna i have to get the whole shot exactly. right or whatever whatever works for them yep yeah i did the same thing man i hated i hated being mid-pack so it was like yep i'm getting i way rather just get the whole shot or at least top three four right exactly yeah the start and that first two laps on a supercar, even outdoors, depending on if it had big jumps. Glen Helen, I hated Glen Helen. Mm -hmm. they, the jumps were so big, yeah. wide open, and you're jumping 100 foot doubles or bigger with five guys around you. In the mud and ruts. Oh my gosh, it was, I hated Glen Helen. I loved that track, but I hated the national day. Yeah. Because the jumps were so In the big. back, right? Like when they would jump you up over that uh, other Step side. Step up, it was huge. So scary. So the first couple of laps, even in Supercross, I hated that jumping three wide on a triple. Mm. I remember Nico Izzy when I came back in 2012. First lap, 
I'm right in the middle and I'm like, oh my gosh, here we go. And he just scrubs it. And I mean, his back wheel missed my front wheel. And I'm like, what are you? It's so mad. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The scrubbing, we didn't really deal with that a ton, at least in my career. Yeah. That's a whole other element of gnarly now where you got to go, okay, not only am I mid pack, but are these, is someone right in front of me going to scrub? And now I've got to go this way to miss his wheel. And I wasn't, Stuart changed it, but I feel like it got the scrubbing. Everyone started scrubbing. But now it doesn't seem like they scrub that much. There's a few guys that do, but I don't see like the- It depends on their job. Really scrubbing super gnarly and hard, like staying low, like a steward. Deegan does. Deegan He's does. a scrubber. Some of, it's, some of it's for show, right? Like it definitely scrubbing works, but at a point it's too, it's like, okay, yeah. you could just do this much and it's just as much as this much, yeah. right? Yeah. So, I don't know. Anyway. Um, so- 2002 ends up pretty great for you. Um, you stay on with KTM again. Did you have a two-year deal? Your contract. Okay. Yeah. End of 03. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, and in 2003, I left the team. Was that that was when? Uh, well, GL was still there. Rhino came on. Yep. Drace Outdoors. Yep. And who else was there? Boniface. Boniface, maybe. Yeah. Boniface was there. Um, so how was that season going? Going into in the preseason, how was it going? Did you guys make improvements to the bike? Were you now you've got a season under your belt? Yeah, I think the bike was the same. I don't think we did a whole lot to change it. Yeah, it was pretty yeah. much the same bike going into that. But it was just the experience, the gate drops on Supercross, getting some outdoors under my belt. Yeah, now you know what to expect. Yeah. So t- take me through that twenty. 20- 2003 season Um, because you had a really good start but then it kind of more were the finishes well so Anaheim you went 6 10 3 6 5 7 11 2 you got a second at Salt Lake yep and then you did the first national and then that was in yeah I retore my ACL again you did yeah same knee yeah so I got a couple podiums in Supercross that year yeah I think um, really, it comes down to the start, you know. The other one's probably bad start or crashing or something like that. Um, yeah, so I was riding after Supercross. I did Glen Helen. Where'd I end up at Glen Helen? I think I got a seventh one moto. You were 11th overall, overall. Yeah. yeah. Um, I was riding at Paris, or not Paris, Lake Elsinore, and there was a rhythm section. You go like, double triple triple and i tried to go double double triple i got the rhythm off and i framed it and just hyper extended my knee and i didn't even tear my acl i ripped the bone out you know how they yeah do a little deal and they ripped it out yeah and that hurts so bad they take a chunk of your tibia and your patella Mm -hmm. with the ligament there that patellar tendon yeah and then they just screw that bone into your like a cork yeah that they put in there Yeah. yeah and you pulled it out i just ripped it right out you Felt know. nice. Oh my gosh, I was in worst pain. I remember just riding around that track, just. But ACLs are only, they hurt for what, twenty minutes? Yeah, it's funny minutes. how the pain does go away. The pain goes away. Yeah. It's excruciating pain, but it's not. It doesn't last for hours. Yeah, it's not like a dislocation or a fracture. I mean, don't get me wrong. It still hurts. The swelling, everything, it yeah. still hurts. But that excruciating pain goes away. <laughs> <laughs> so you got it fixed then, right then that summer? Yep. Yep. And that was the end of your year. That was the end of my year. Yeah. That was 2003, right? Yeah. Um, yep. And then I was done there going into 2004. I tore my ACL again. Ugh. I believe a couple weeks before the start of the East Coast. Okay. It was 2004. Yeah. You were Geico. Geico, Honda, right? Yeah. And how did I that signed, come about? Um, the Geico contract. Mm-hmm. We were just after 03. Um, I just wanted to get off the KTMs. I wanted to get on a good bike. Um, something I can just be more comfortable on. Yep. Um, so I think I had a couple offers, maybe PC again. And um, Honda just gave me a really good offer mm. to come come ride for them. Yeah. And that team was awesome at the time. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 
yeah, really good team. So when you hopped on, and, and that was, they had made the switch to four strokes already or no? Yeah. 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 So how was that too? Because had you ridden four strokes before that? Yeah. Yeah. No, it was definitely different. I liked it after I got comfortable on it. I mean, the bike was way heavier. Yeah. And they were, they're nothing like they are now. Um, They had torque and stuff, but the bike was good. Yeah. It was definitely better than the 125. It just took time to get used to it. Yeah. You know. So you made that transition. Same knee, you blew out again or the other Same knee. Gosh, yeah, three times already that one knee. So I, I didn't think I finished. Um, it was Houston, in '04. Um, yeah, yeah, Houston '04. This would have been middle of February. Middle of February, yeah. So I blew up mini ACL right before that race, and then I didn't even think I finished that race. I thought I did it in practice, but I over cleared the triple just a little bit, landed in the pocket, and hyperextended it, and just hurt it. Oh, I think during the race. And so then I had to get it fixed again. So then I missed all of 2004. Yeah, that was cross outdoors. That was the only race you did in 2004. So that makes sense. Yep. Gosh. So my first ACL, one month after surgery, I was riding. My second ACL was three months after surgery, I started riding. And then my last two, I actually waited the six months that you're supposed to. And the reason they say that, I'm sure you got told this, um, that graft that they take, whether it's patella or hamstring, uh, it actually dies mm-hmm. and has to regenerate. Yep. And while it's dead, it's about three months. Yep. You'll feel great. Yep. Dude, I'm ready to go. Let's race. Mm-hmm. It's at its weakest point. Yep. So that's why they say wait to six months. Exactly. And then it's not fully healed for a year, right? Yeah. But you're good to go yeah. in six months. Yeah. Crazy. So you, did you have a two-year deal with Geico then? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So 04 to 05. Okay, so you did wait this this last ACL. You did wait the right amount of time, or no? Yep. Six okay. months. Six months. Yeah, okay. that's why I was out the whole season. I just did the one race, East Coast round. Yeah, that takes you out all summer. You're right. Okay, so you start riding again, getting ready for 05. Yep. Um, take us into that season. 05, um, hired Mike LaRocco's trainer. Forget who that was. Uh, I forget his name. But right before um, Supercross, hired him. Um, I think I struggled the first couple rounds. Um, yeah, you went 14, 11, 22 at your first three. 14, 11, 22. But then a oh, complete wow. turnaround. You won San Francisco. You had one, two, four, six, two. The next five. Yeah. I so know what? I was sick. Okay. I was, was going to say sick. something turned around here. A, I believe A1 and Phoenix, I was sicker than a dog. Okay. Yeah. Which is common, right? Because of all the stress. Dude, I used to- I was sick every year. <laughs> every year going into A1 and the second round, I think it was Phoenix. I was always sick. I learned to like just ramp my program way down for the, about the two weeks leading up. Mm-hmm. Just get a lot of sleep, you know, like, because I knew the stress alone would destroy my immune system. <laughs> I'd show up with cold sores. I'm all, uh, and, uh, I was the same it's way. Stressed out. Yeah. <laughs> and plus, when you're training like that, your immune system's a little bit weaker. Yeah. So if you're going to the mall, yeah. out to dinner, it's easier to get sick. Yeah, you got to chill out those couple weeks before the opener. In the afternoon. Uh, so what was, so, okay, you were sick, but man, to go from like 14, 11, 22 to one. I don't remember what happened. Um, was that when you, I know at some point you were seeing a sports psychologist. That's top secret pain. Oh, what are you? I didn't say that. <laughs> yeah, so I hung out with Jeff Emig a little bit back in the day, and he's like, "Dude, you need to go see my sports psychiatrist." So I went to go see him. I saw him maybe two or three times before uh, that race. Okay. Yeah. Did it help? I mean, obviously, it yeah. looks like it helped. It did. Yeah. Okay. It just get you thinking about the right stuff. Yeah. You know, he gets you in there, and you're closing your eyes, and you start telling him what you're worried about, and then he's like, "Okay, well, forget about that stuff. Let's start focusing on this stuff." And yeah, so it did help. Yeah, absolutely. It's some of it's. It's not like it's super complex stuff, no, or it's not. But it's just someone talks you through it, and you go, "Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, that does make sense." Just get you thinking yeah. about the right stuff. Um, we have a, a sports psychologist with Elevate, our training company, and she said something that I thought was really profound. 
when you have an injury, or in your case, three in a row, mm-hmm. and I, I believe injuries are, um, especially if it's to the same area, they're, they compound, right? Like one plus one doesn't equal two. It's kind of like three. Yeah. Because you're doing this physical damage that'll, you know, your knee's never 100% again. Yeah. Then you do it again. Well, now it's, are we at 80%? Now you do it again. Like, where the hell is it now? And there's also a psychological injury. Um, you're relating about it, coming up short on something or whatever to, oh, I, I just hurt myself, right? It, it attaches. And so you have to be able to work through that stuff. And, and she says, if you're out on the track thinking about getting hurt, yeah, you're, you still have a, an injury up here that you've got to work through. Yeah, and so absolutely. Um, that made a lot of sense to me. I'm like, where the hell were you back when I was racing? I needed you. <laughs> um, <laughs> because we we just go oh, fix it. Just heal the thing and then let's go. Okay. Like, I got to get back out of there. Because you mm-hmm. you got to get results yeah. or you're not going to have a ride. Mm-hmm. But man, we rush back. Even physically, if we're there, a lot of us aren't there mentally. Yeah, not to you. You know, um, I just had Especially a, if you get back-to-back injuries. Yeah. You know how that is. Now you're on the bike and you're like, man, I don't want to get hurt. So you're not riding as aggressive, you know. I had, and every, you know, this is pretty standard. I looked through your career, it was about 10 years. We each have about 10 years, give or take. I made two seasons where I didn't have an injury. I made one, I think. Maybe two. That sucks. Yeah. <laughs> How are you supposed to build? Yeah. <laughs> you're constantly hurt. Some of these guys like Dungy, Broken Collarbone. McGrath. Michael. Carmichael, yeah. yeah, you know, Ricky had one knee and he didn't even crash. Yeah, ACL and a collarbone, maybe. Did he have a collarbone? Yeah, he probably did. And no, yeah, amazes me how out of control he was and how hard he crashed. Even Stewart, yeah. those guys crashed. I might have one crash my whole life as hard as them, not even as hard as them. <laughs> yeah, and they did it over and over, and they just bounced right back up. I know. It's impressive. It is as impressive as anything. Yeah. So take me through your win. Um, you had gotten a second before. This is your first win, man. Tell me about it. Tell me about that. that. Were you feeling all day or? I feeling what? Just like feeling good all day. Afterwards? No, before. Like oh, before. Yeah. Um, how did it come? Like a lot of times. Yeah, I was just super relaxed. Mm-hmm. You know, I think the sports psychiatrist got me in the right frame of mind and. I was relaxed. I liked the track. And yeah, that was a high. I don't I don't remember the race, like how it went, but did you have like a lead where it was a pretty... I think I whole shotted and then um, I don't remember if it was Andrew Short. Tedesco had fallen, I believe, in the first turn. Um, I, so we were, I was battling with someone. I can't remember who it was. Okay. But then I kind of checked out a little bit and got a lead. Not real, real big. But Look, maybe four or five seconds, something like that. And I just remember telling myself, I'm riding at Barona. I'm riding at Barona, my, my local track. This is another practice day. Yeah. That, that was going through my mind the whole time. Just another practice day, just another practice day. And it worked. Yeah. You know, you what are thinking about being out front? What about the last lap? When you got the white flag, did you just go, oh man, I got one more lap. I'm going to win this? Oh, yeah. I was stressed, <laughs> very stressed. <laughs> It's nerve wracking. Yeah, you know, oh, I had a race before. You're out front. You got one lap. Don't blow it. Don't blow Just it. Finish the race. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, that that race went really, really good for me. And then when you when you come over the finish line, it's like that's a that's a wave of emotion, right? Then you get back to your crew. Then that's another one. Then you get up on the podium. It's another one. Yeah. Yeah. I remember Tedesco. He ended up third. And he came up to me after our interviews and he goes, feels good, right? I said, oh yeah, feels so good. Yeah. Hard to describe it. Oh, it's it's a high that, like Chase Sexton is talking about, like it's there for a second and then it's gone mm-hmm. and you just want to keep repeating it, keep repeating it. But at least I got one. I'm yeah. one hit wonder, but <laughs> at least I got one. <laughs> hey, there's a lot of people that don't get one. Yeah. Um, so take me through the rest of that season. Like I said, you, from there on, man, you turn it around second, the next weekend at Anaheim. And I'm trying to remember, was this during Ivan's run where he, was it 04, 05, he won both titles? Okay. So he was on it, on it. Yeah. He was really tough. But great rest of your season, man. Jeez. Yeah. 
I mean, you know how it is, Ping. Like, I just had 2004, the whole year off, come back to race my first race in a year, pretty much. And first round, you struggle, your confidence are down. Yeah. And I don't, I don't remember what happened in those races. If I crashed or something had happened, I wouldn't have finished those positions. Right. Riding, you know, to my capability. But but then getting that win, then you're going into the next round, and you're like, I can win. Yeah. You're confident. Just changes your mindset, huh? Yeah. And that was probably the first time in my career that I had that confidence. I had that confidence as an amateur. I knew I could win. Mm-hmm. And then, well, in my A year. Um, but you know how that confidence works. Like, and you got to believe in yourself. That's it's such a different feeling, right? Going to the races with that, with that belief. Yeah, I can win. Like, and that's a, less pressure too. It is less pressure. Like Carmichael, he believed his whole career. Yeah. So he had way less pressure on himself. He would just go out. He knew he was going to win. Yeah. Conversely, like I know you've been in this place too, where you show up and you. You know you either don't have the fitness or you're not oh, yeah. happy on the bike or you don't have the speed. Like, you know it's probably not going to be a great week. Oh, yeah. That is not fun. No. Yeah. That's depressing. I've had 07 outdoors. I had that. We'll get to that, but yeah. It's not fun. So take me through the rest of the season here. Um, and you seem like, just looking at your results, kind of like me, you liked Supercross way better. Yeah. Yeah, I was a Supercross guy for sure. So, um, after I, Supercross. And why was that for you? Like, I have my reasons. Why do you think that was for you? For Supercross? Yeah. I was just more comfortable. Yeah. I was never a guy. I rode like a Wyndham or like a Sexton or the Lawrence Brothers, real smooth. I never hung it out. And that was something you had to do outdoors, even in Supercross. For me to get up to that next notch to start winning more, you really have to hang it out. Mm-hmm. And I was never there. Was it ever like a conditions thing for you? Because growing up in Arizona and, and then out here, I didn't really get a lot of like ruts, muddy ruts. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I hurt my knees right away. So anytime it was slick mm-hmm. and I was dabbing my foot, that hurt. Mm-hmm. So then I'm hesitant. Yeah. Yeah. For no. me, it was very conditional. Yeah. Like if the me traction too. was good, it was overcast, mm-hmm. let's go. Mm-hmm. I, had those, I got three outdoor podiums. They were all... What is it? Overcast days where the traction was good. Yep. Yeah. No, I was the same way. It's just like we were talking about being comfortable. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, and I was the same way. We didn't have a whole lot of ruts out here. Mm-hmm. So we went back. Like a, you'd get a hard rut. Yeah. That's, it's not East Coast ruts. It's totally different. Totally different. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But you saw some good rides, even in 05, uh, sixth at Millville, seventh at Glen Helen. We're six at Millville? Yeah. Really? Yeah. <laughs> wow. That's surprising. Yeah. Impressive. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty good. But again, Millville, if it's good conditions, yeah. That's nice dirt. That's just like that track be fun. familiar with. Yeah. Yeah. So after Supercross, I moved to Michigan to live with Jeff Stanton. Okay. So I believe this may have been the only year that I did a full year. So like you're saying, the conditions overcast. First couple nationals were hot. And I'm good for 15 minutes, and then the anchor starts coming out. I mean, I was working my butt off, and we're getting up at 6 o'clock in the morning. We're cycling. We're running five or six miles. We're putting in the work and all the work in before that. And so we get to, I believe, Bud's Creek. It's overcast, and it's probably 75 degrees, 80 degrees. It was a perfect. So we're like, okay, this is going to be better. Same thing, 15 minutes, hit the anchor. Hmm. So he goes, we need to go to the doctor and get tested. Well, I ended up having mono that turned into Epstein-Barr. Mm-hmm. So I had Epstein-Barr during that whole season or outdoor season. So the one year that I finished was able to race the whole season, I had Epstein-Barr. So I got a steroid shot and it helped a little bit, but you know, I don't know if you ever had it, but I never had it, but, um, can't do much. Yeah. You know, I still I, trained through it. I felt like I had it at times. <laughs> just <laughs> yeah. being out of shape. Yeah. No, it's not good when you get it. Yeah. Um. So what was it? What did you guys do at Stanton's? Anything that you learned back there that was interesting? Um. No, just his his dedication and just every day to grind. Every mm-hmm. day. You know. Did that help? Kind of being in that environment. Um. That's hard to say. 
because we he had his own outdoor track and I was pretty much just riding by myself putting in motos um I think riding with other people is better mm -hmm. you know but like Stuart Carmichael all those guys rode by themselves trained by themselves um but I think for me being here in Cali and putting in motos and you're always riding with somebody you can always judge yourself on someone else's speed and all that um but no we had a we had a really good time coming around halfway mark Jeff's got his pants down and his dong's hanging out <laughs> <laughs> yeah He's doing this. <laughs> All conservative Justin. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Such a rad guy. Him and his family are so awesome. But yeah, just spent the three months out there training with Jeff and and it was nothing it was nothing new, you know. Yeah. But um did the humidity help? I know when I stayed with Sellers a couple of summers and then Ricky one summer, man, just a couple weeks down there. Oh yeah. Then you go to the race and you're like, Yeah, it's cool. Why isn't it ever cool when I'm living in California? And they're like, dude, it's hot. Yeah. It, you just, you get used to that humidity. It's like, yeah, you get acclimated to the humidity. Yeah, it's tough for California boys to go back east and ride in the humidity. Yeah, it really is. Even if you're in good shape. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I get, I sweat a lot. And so when I get in that humidity, man, I'm just, it's pouring out of me. I yeah. can't get water in fast. Me too. Yeah, my goggles, I got tampon pads on my goggles. <laughs> I got the blue towels packed in my helmet. Like you're crazy, right? 15 minutes in, I my goggles are full of sweat. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so going into 2006, yep. um, did you stay with Geico again? Yeah. I signed, um, two more or two, two year contract. Two year extension. Again. Yep. Sweet. Yep. Um, tell you what, let's take a little break right here. We're going to go into 2006. This is your Torley Designs timeout. Stick around. We're going to be back here to finish with Billy Leninovich. Join the 4 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped and get ready for shaved boy summer by going to manscaped.com for 20% off plus free shipping using the code whiskey throttle. As the great Will Smith and DJ Jazzy Jeff said, it's like the summer's a natural aphrodisiac. Listen, uh, I've been using this new tool, uh, both the weed whacker for my nose hair and the trimmer, the lawnmower 4.0. These things are awesome. It's almost impossible to cut yourself. And if you've ever taken a nick out of your nether regions, uh, you know how important that is. Uh, cause let's just be real. Nobody likes the hairy guy at the beach, right? Like it's gross. It's time to bundle up with Manscaped Performance Package 4.0. Inside this package, you'll find their Lawnmower 4.0 trimmer, Weed Whacker Ear and Nose Hair Trimmer, Crop Preserver Ball Deodorant, Crop Reviver Toner, Performance Boxer Briefs, and their Shed Travel Bag to hold your goodies. First off, the Performance Package 4.0 includes the Lawnmower 4.0. This trimmer was designed with summer intentions in mind. Their fourth gen trimmer features a cutting edge ceramic blade to reduce grooming accents thanks to their advanced skin safe technology. The Lawnmower 4.0 has a 7,000 RPM motor, a new multifunction on off switch, which you can engage uh, a travel lock, which is super nice if you've ever gone through security with something vibrating in your bag, ladies. And gives you the ability to turn the 4000K LED spotlight on and off when needed for a more precise shave. Did I mention this trimmer is waterproof too? Both pool and beach party approved. Manscaped even has you covered with their signature crop mop ball wipes for any, dare I say, spontaneous decisions. Want to take it up a notch? Manscaped Shears 2.0 is an all-encompassing nail kit to tackle those gross sandal nails you might acquire. Seal the deal with Manscaped's liquid formulations. Before heading outside, use Crop Preserver Ball Deodorant to keep you on your game in the heat. For any on-the-go ball sweats, freshen up with Manscaped's Crop Reviver and hop back into the mix with confidence. Manscaped even threw in two free gifts to their Performance Package 4.0, the, Man the Manscaped Premium Boxers and the Shed Travel Bag. Bring your comfort in boxers to another level. So here it is. Get 20% off plus free shipping worldwide with the code WhiskeyThrottle at Manscaped.com. That's 20% off plus free shipping using the code WhiskeyThrottle. No caps, no spaces. It's time to trim off those spring flowers this summer and give your beach balls a shine with Manscaped. There's a new product on the market that's going to help you with your riding and racing, and it's Elevate Action Sports. If you've not yet gone and checked it out at ElevateActionSports.com, it's a collective of riding coaches, the likes of which has never been put together. Grant Langston, Ryan Hughes, Jeff Emick, Johnny Campbell, and myself, David Pingree, bringing all of our years of experience in professional racing to one place with professionally produced videos and all kinds of supporting staff to help you 
with your mental side of racing, your physical side, your bike setup, your bike maintenance. We cover it all. Get to Elevate Action Sports right now and join the community. Dunlop. There is a reason every AMA championship in the past decade was won on Dunlop tires. They are the best. Choose the best performing tire and a brand that has never wavered in their support of our sport. Choose Dunlop. Pro Circuit. Pro Circuit products are designed with one goal in mind, winning. Through passion and hard work, Pro Circuit has operated the most successful 250 team in the history of the sport. They use that same formula when developing exhaust, engine, and suspension parts for every brand. When only the highest level of performance is acceptable, trust Pro Circuit. Since 2009, Seat Concepts has been dedicated to making the best aftermarket seats. More comfort, more grip, more riding. For 10 years, we've continued to raise the bar. Innovation and American craftsmanship make Seat Concepts the world leading manufacturer of power sports seats. Something from nothing. That's what Nihilo Concepts is about. It starts with a spark, an idea, a concept, which leads to a design and finishes with engineered excellence with the highest quality products created with durability in mind. All our products are made in the USA at our state-of-the-art facility in Stewart, Florida. Whether you are a weekend warrior, ride for fun, or at the highest level of competition, Nihilo Concepts offers innovative titanium, aluminum, and carbon fiber parts for your dirt bike. We offer a wide variety of products that you can customize to your liking. Browse our site for foot pegs, brake tips, engine components, specialty tools, frame grip tape, lever grips, carbon fiber components, motor stands, our secondary on-switch plus much more. Head to NihiloConcepts.com and see for yourself why factory teams like Red Bull KTM, Rockstar Husqvarna, Troy Lee Designs Gas Gas, Orange Brigade, Club MX, KLM Gas Gas, and some of the fastest riders in the world choose Nihilo Concepts. Specialized Bicycles. Specialized leads the way in the world of bicycling. Whether it's cross-country racing, downhill, e-bikes, enduro, road, gravel, dual slalom, dirt jumping, or all mountain bikes that do it all, Specialized has the perfect ride for you. The brand is synonymous with engineering excellence and innovation that steers the industry. Visit your local Specialized dealer for a test ride and see just how good Specialized products are. With a rich history in motocross, ProX has been dedicated to supplying quality components since 1975. Whether you're rebuilding an engine or just need a new chain, ProX Racing Parts aims to bridge the gap between OE quality and affordability. ProX has over 9,000 part numbers and over 60 different product types that are manufactured by highly reputable or even OEM suppliers and are offered at affordable prices to help keep riders on the bike instead of in the garage. Visit ProX.com to search parts for your bike or check them out at your favorite online or local dealer. Audio the guys are just breaking in their race bikes, which will leave on the semi this Saturday to go to the first Supercross for our coast in Orlando. Uh, so the guys are just be goofing off a little bit, do some cool photos, do some cool videos. When you go racing, you want to do well, but a big key is keeping the bikes on the track. That's why we chose to work with Motul. Expectations coming in as a rookie is just to try and get my feet wet and uh, honestly just send it, see where I end up and uh, do my best out there, but just ride aggressive and ride like myself in practice and I uh, should have a good time. Challenges of this sport, I believe, is just simply staying healthy. Uh, with how fast we're going um, and what we're doing, your margin for mistake is really, really small.
Stay Sick. If you have little rippers, then you have had to have seen Stay Sick bikes by now. We have created bike and experiences that allow kids to develop sooner and empower them to find their own ride. From learning to ride to sharpening skills, the Stay Sick promise is accelerated growth. Whatever path your family chooses, it's going to be the ride of your life. Stay Sick Stability Cycles. I'm on vacation every single day because I love my occupation. Hey, I'm on vacation. If you don't like your life, then you should go and change it. Welcome back, everybody. That was your Troy Lee Designs timeout. If you have not seen all of the stuff going on over at TroyLeeDesigns.com, go check those guys out. Follow them on Instagram. They've got their own race team account you can follow. Uh, but all kinds of new stuff, summer gear coming out, and uh, always the coolest designs from Troy and the boys over there. Uh, so uh, check them out. <clears throat> all right, Billy, <clears throat> back to your story here. We're jumping back in at 2006. Mm -hmm. You had just signed a two-year extension with Factory Connection. Yep. Uh, which, did it switch to Geico at this point, or was it no, still? No, still okay. like Samsung... So be no fear. Gotcha. Gotcha. Connection. Gotcha. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. um, this was a good team. Like, yeah, there was a lot of, uh, it was interesting because probably about, maybe it's in this window, but Mitch was always doing their motors. Yes. And then at a point, Kibby and oh. Honda kind of went, hey, you know, Mitch would always build you a, well, what he said was a good motor, maybe 40, yeah, two horsepower. And then he'd be like, all right, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> and then we're getting the best. Well, he... It's in his own best interest, right? He's going to spend more time working on his bike. So he'd make sure he was at 45. Yeah. And you were at 42. Yes. And he knew who he had to race against. It was yep. brilliant. Yeah. But he was still so far ahead of everyone up until that point mm -hmm. that it was like he could do that. Yeah. It was probably 2005 or into 2006, I believe, when Kibby started taking over. Okay. Yeah. And it was a gradual progression because they were still using Mitch's exhaust yes. for a while. And then that eventually even went away. Yeah. So, <clears throat> and Gibby did a good job. He's a smart our dude. Was, yeah. Our motors were really, really good. Yep. Absolutely. So, all right. Take us through 2006. Um, you were out the whole end of 05 again, but you said you healed the knee up good this time, right? No, I think I, I finished outdoors, I believe. Oh, yeah. Actually, you're right. What yeah. was I talking about? I was thinking of the year before. Yeah. Okay. So you finished this season out. I finished 2005 season out. And then you had a nice healthy run into 06? Um, yeah. Okay. With the Epstein bar. I don't, oh, yeah, that's right. Did you started. take some time off to let that? The problem with that is just road. That's all you can do is rest. Right? Yeah, no, I I got a steroid shot um, to help heal it, or I don't know what it was, but um, yeah, just kept riding and training through it Okay. and stuff. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then how, how were things feeling going into 06? Again, we, we talked about good. like, you have an injury and then it's like, man, all of these cards you've stacked mm -hmm. crumble and you got to build from the bottom right. again. Yeah. Was it good going into a season healthy and, and kind of continuing to build? Oh yeah, absolutely. Especially getting my Supercross win and I think a couple podiums, like my two year deal two year. too, right? So you're two kind of feeling good yeah. about it. Okay. Yeah. And then going into 2006, being healthy, you know, yeah, not taking a year off and all that stuff. So. Going in 2006, I was um, pretty confident, and I was always in there for the title hunt, you know. Yeah. Not winning everything, but always in the top three right there. So, yeah. And that was always my goal is just being up there. Yeah, being the man. And staying healthy. Yeah. I mean, at, up to this point, I had three ACL reconstructions and a lot of time off the bike and mm -hmm. stuff like that, you know. Were you, every time you blew your knee out, you had knee braces on? Yep. Yeah, I had the CTI. Um, was it just CTI at the time? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then CTI two or something. Yep, and then went to Asterix. But yeah, that's a hard. People say, "Oh, those things don't do anything." I have to ride with knee braces, or I don't feel comfortable. Yeah, you know, like there's no way. And I got chicken legs, so my legs look super skinny. <laughs> but can't have that. Yeah. Um. So take us into the opener here, 2006, um, podium at the opening round. You went, you went three, two, four, seven, six, 11, nine, eight, 12, nine, seven. Um, so pretty consistent. Everything's top 10. You had multiple podiums. Mm -hmm. 
Um, what was that season? Yeah, it was good. I think I went into, I was leading the championship going into San Diego, I believe. Okay. And first turn, or not a first turn pileup, but hit the hay bale on the inside and tipped over. Mm. I think I finished 11th that year. So that was kind of a snowball. I think my results started going back a little bit from mm. there. But yeah, my first few rounds, um, they were good. I think. And who was winning in 06? Was that Weimer? No. No. They would have been um, Langston. Langston. Short. Oh, okay. Maybe those guys. Okay. Top three. Yeah. Gotcha. Langston and Short. And Shorty, was he KTM or was he Factory Honda? Factory Honda. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. So what about uh, you did four nationals and then you disappeared again? Yep. Got a night at Hangtown. Oh, mm-hmm. six. I moved to Stewart's house. My dad went and talked to Big James, asked him if I can come out and train and ride with James. So for outdoors, I moved to Florida, rented a house, and then trained at James's house. Um, what was that like? It was good, dude. It was really good. Just being able to ride with James, kid is unreal. Mm. You can never get sick of watching him ride. You could watch him ride all day long. Mm. For months and what was he doing? Um, anything different than you had seen? Or... He rode a lot. So when I was an amateur, I rode a lot. I didn't start training until I turned pro, mountain bike and cycling gym and stuff like that. James, I never, I didn't really train with him off the bike. It was just our riding. Mm-hmm. But he was, at, before I came, he would do five 20 minute motos or 20 lap motos for Supercross. Five, five. When I came, we bumped it down to three because I couldn't do it. <laughs> but yeah, still even three twenties every day. Yep. Wow. Yeah. That's crazy, man. You know, it's interesting because I this is a common theme when I talk to um, guys who were championship level guys, like you know, legendary guys. They all have that in common. I wrote a lot. Yeah. Um, everything off the bike was just in addition to when I had time for it. The stuff on the bike was the focus and it makes sense. Yeah. Um, I mean, you still got to have, you got to do the cycling and mountain biking for the cardio. Obviously now, you know, but. Yeah, but do you, if you're doing three twenties a day? It's tough, man. Yeah. I think that stuff's nice, a nice addition, but. Yeah. You can do the work just on the bike. I can tell you in 97 when Ricky won his first national title we rode literally five gallons of gas every single day and then he would tell his mom we were going to the gym and we'd go to like (laughs) you know sunny's pit barbecue and get iced tea and go you know buy a new cassette tape (laughs) blockbuster um 95 percent of what he did was just on the bike yeah and that was enough yeah you know for him to do what he did but then look when he got in with eldon well it became another level right that was a whole nother it's just interesting that all these guys have that in common. Yeah. Three twenties? Who does that? It's a lot of riding. On a supercross track, especially where you start yeah. to get tired and then you know. Okay, so anyway, um what didn't doesn't look <laughs> it doesn't look like it was healthy. Well <laughs> Yeah. I, I struggled outdoors. Yeah. I did too. So I'm not knocking you. Yeah. I'm laughing because I get it. I know. I struggled outdoors. And I don't know most of my Injuries were all outdoors. Oh, were they? Most of them, yeah. Um, and then it started getting better at Bud's Creek. I think that was probably my last race that year. Um, I was running second for maybe 10 minutes to go. Um, Zach Osborne was out front. I was second. Oh, I announced that season. Did you? Yeah, because I remember that race. Zach was gone. That's yeah. when I called him Snack Pack, and he got really mad at me. <laughs> That wasn't my, I didn't make up that nickname. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you were second. I so he was running second. Yep. And fell over in a big old rut, tipped over, got back up. I think I was seventh or eighth. Okay. And then me and Langston, I went, you dropped down this off cor- or off camber corner. I went outside and it had like a little kicker in the rut. Langston went inside and I hit it and I caught air. I got a picture of it and landed right on Langston on the side of him. 
and torn my ACL, my right knee this time. Uh, yeah. So I finally start getting the ball rolling. I start riding good. And then another injury, another ACL. Dang it. Yeah. And so then I was out the rest of that year. So that's June. That takes you up to January too. Yeah. If you're waiting the six months, yep. right? And I believe 07, I went back to Stewart's house to train with them for Supercross because I did East Coast that year. Yep. Okay. Yep. And how was that? It was good. I stayed out at Stewart's house, I think all of um all of Supercross or right before Supercross. I think I went out there a few months before. Um I was struggling. Oh seven was a tough year for me. Um the first couple rounds, my results were crap. And Big James is like, Billy, what are you doing? Like you ride so good at how at the house and get to the race and you're not doing the same. Like Big James, I don't know. I don't know what's going on. I just don't feel comfortable. Well, right before Daytona, they bring the semi out and we test. I jump on my race bike at his house and I can't ride it. They told me that my subframe was five mils too tall, but I don't believe that. Okay. Yeah. So whatever change that they did was huge. And then I went out and I finished fourth at Daytona and... It was a big difference. Huh. But there was something up with the bike that I wasn't comfortable with, and so it was making me struggle. Mm. Yeah. That was different on your race bike from your practice, practice bike. bike. Mm. Yeah. They say it's a subframe, but I just don't see that. Because I think I used to run a 10 mil subframe shorter, mm -hmm. and they said it was only 5 mil. But, yeah, I'm not sure. Mm. Seems really weird. Seems like it. Yeah, but... You know, but if you're if you're sensitive to that, like yeah, it would make you feel like the bike's always up high, yeah, hitting you in the back, yeah, yeah. I jumped on the bike in Road Stewart's test track and could not ride it. Huh. Jump on my practice bike and I was back to my speed. You know, interesting. Yeah. Well, you did have so Daytona fourth, Orlando fifth. You got a fourth at Detroit, mm -hmm. so you definitely stepped up from there. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> was the team? What were they saying at this point? They're just always like, what's going on? Trying to pick your brain and figure out, is it the bike? Is it off the bike? Is it your personal life? Yeah. I don't know, trying to figure it out. But once we got to Stewart's house and did the testing and got the bike dialed in, it was definitely a lot better. Yeah. Results started coming down. And Okay. So you uh, finished out that season. Mm -hmm. um, six overall in points. Mm -hmm. Um Went into nationals. Looks like you raced the whole season. That's good. Was it? Yeah, I did. Looks like it. So I did too. All right. Hello, yeah. How'd that summer go? You know, I mean, I don't remember. Not good. Not good. I remember. What was it? We were at Millville, and for some reason, I couldn't sleep that night. So I may have got like an hour or two of sleep before Millville. I was super tired at the track. I don't remember what my result was, but it was bad. I remember jumping in the the rental car, driving back to the hotel, and it was one of the times like I wanted to drive this car off a cliff. Mm -hmm. It's just super frustrated, depressed. It's tough when you're not doing good, and these people are paying you to go out there and perform. Yeah, and all that pressure. Like, yeah, that was a very low point. Didn't last long, but. I remember there was a point where you were drinking a lot too. And I remember maybe hearing about that, that you were just struggling. Yeah. Well, it was mainly when I was hurt. Yeah. So my last two ACLs taken six months off. Yeah. I, I was there, dude. I mean, you, you, <laughs> it's just so frustrating. Mm -hmm. You get to a point, you're like, screw it. Yeah. And this is the one thing that'll numb it. Yeah. For making it does not think about it. I mean, it's not good. I don't. Yeah, shouldn't do it, but yeah, it numbs the pain and yeah. So take me through the end of that season. Geico Honda, your contracts expired. Contracts up, yep. Um, struggled, I think, that whole season. I think there was a few races that I had didn't even finish. Um, went into Glen Helen. I think that was the last round. Came up short on the big triple at Glen Helen. This big step up in the back. 
and sprained my wrist. So I wasn't even, I wasn't able to even race the last round. Mm. And so that was done. And then, um, I had an agent at the time. We were looking for something in 2008 and Kurt Nicole, I believe was a team manager for KTM. And this was at the point where they didn't even have a race team, but they were, I think MDK maybe MDK. get it over or something. Okay. Yeah. So I called Kurt and I said, Hey, I want to race for you guys. 2008. So we were talking, talking to my manager. I'm like, Hey, what's going on with KTM? He's like, Oh, we're still talking. We're still talking. Well, Kurt gets me a contract. I call my manager and I'm like, Hey, you hear anything about the contract yet? And he goes, no, they're going to hire someone else. I'm like, okay, cool. And never talked to him again, signed the contract luckily for, luckily I took over and was talking to myself. So then I signed a two-year contract with MDK KTM. Okay. No, well, not with MDK, but with factory KTM. Okay. Contract. Yeah. And was that for two fifties? Uh, two fifties, um, supercross and then four fifty outdoors. Okay. Yeah. Now, how was that bike? Um, uh, cause you rode, you never rode the four stroke KTM. No. So this time when you got on it, it was four stroke. Yeah. How was that? The bike, it wasn't bad. It wasn't the best bike. I don't, it didn't have a linkage still. Oh, it still didn't? Mm -hmm. No, it, they didn't get a linkage until the Austin came in. Yeah. Yeah. Cause they were fighting that. They wanted to be known not to have a linkage. And I think Takasha was like, hey, we got to put a linkage on this thing. So, um, yeah, the bike wasn't bad. You can compete. I think I got up fourth or a couple fourths that year. I never got a podium. So, yeah, you got a fourth at Anaheim. Some top tens. Yeah. Looks like you got through most of the year, huh? Let's see. Did you have any injuries that year? 2007? I don't think so. 2006? Was it my knee? Oh, I did. Yes. Because you only did five Supercross rounds. Um, then you missed from February to June. Yeah. Yeah. I crashed at Paris and tore a muscle in my lower back. And I was off the bike, I think, for three months. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So... Came back to riding, I think, two weeks after being on the bike, being off the bike for three three months. Um, started racing, went to Red Bud, and finished pretty good. I think I got top 10, maybe the first moto, 10th or 12th or something. Yeah. Second moto, I was done. I didn't want to race. I'm like, just go out there and go ride. <laughs> now, so outdoors, you're riding that 450. Yeah. How was that? I was on the 450. Um I couldn't ride it. Oh, no. I was struggling really, really bad. Yeah. Yeah. If the 250 was tough handling, the 450 was yeah miserable. Miserable. Yeah. Yeah. I couldn't ride it. I was really uncomfortable. Um, you still got like a couple tenths. Yeah. Yeah. So came back two weeks after my injury, started racing, trying to race myself into shape. And then a buddy of mine who knew the KTM guys came up to me and he goes, hey, if you don't go get top 10 at Washugo this weekend, they're going to let you go. I'm like, what? So I went out. I think I went 8-11 or 9-11 for 10th overall. Okay. And then it had nothing to do with KTM, Kurt Nicole or anything. It was an MD, MDK team manager. Yeah. Got top 10 and then cut me. He cut you? Yeah. 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 And I had, my back injury was really bad. I'll have to get you the picture of it. Who was the manager at the time? Um, Danny, maybe Danny Palladino. Danny Palladino. Okay. I remember that name. Yeah. So then what'd you do? That was just it. Now you were just done. Yeah. Contract was up or not my contract, but they let me go after that. Okay. And, um, me and Casey Johnson started, uh, doing some coaching and up okay. at the Christian ministry at the time, trying to get that going. So I did that for, what was that, 2008, um, 2009, my ex-girlfriend's dad owned a big construction business, so I did uh, demolition and grading, uh, um, what's it called? Estimating. Okay. So I did that for about a year, and then Cowie called me, a little less than a year, Cowie called me to start testing for them, and so... Two weeks after 
I had been on the track four or five times. Um, who got hurt? It was a Cowie guy in 09. Uh, Tim Ferry. Oh, okay. Tim Ferry had broken his ankle, I think, really bad. They're like, we want you to go race. Just try to qualify for the mains. So I had back again, riding on the bike for two weeks, been off a bike for almost a year, and straight into racing again. Jeez. Yeah. So I did that. Um, and it was good. I was I qualified for all the mains. I yeah. think in Jacksonville, I got a tent. Yeah. Yeah. So it was, my fitness was getting a little bit better. And then in Vegas, in practice, there was a double, triple, and I kind of overcleared the double a little bit, hit the tr- face of the triple to triple out, and just oh. going out of the stadium. You know how hard rock that is. Yeah. It just broke my collarbone to show. Uh, got two plates and 10 pins and screws in there. And so that was pretty much it from there. Yeah. <laughs> um. Gosh, dang it. And that would have been good because I would have been able to get in the outdoors and my fitness was getting better to yeah. start getting some results and maybe get back on a team, you know? But yeah, it's like you don't want to let that opportunity go by. You're like, man, I'm getting offered a factory cowie ride, but I've only been on the bike two weeks. Yeah. It's kind of a bad position to put you in for them to even ask. Yeah, they just wanted someone out there, Villapoto. He was winning everything mm-hmm. at the time. So I got to go ride with him at the test tracks and watch him. And that dude was gnarly. Yeah. He was so fast. Yeah. He was definitely one of the elite guys. Yeah. So you heal up your shoulder. Yep. What do you, you, you were two years of no pro racing. Yep. Two and a half years, two years. What were you doing in that window? Um, so I actually, uh, Jimmy Button called me. This was in 2010. Jimmy Button called me and asked if, um, I wanted to go race in Europe for Aprilia and he got me a little bit of money to just show up and go race. So again, hadn't been on the bike at all. I borrowed a buddy's bike. I rode it at Barona a couple times. I maybe had four or five rides on a bike and I go to Spain to go race. Um, Straight into a race? I went there a week early to test. Okay. So- Aprilia what? Uh, 450? Yeah. V-twin. Mm, they look good. They look all carbon fiber. They, they look really good. <laughs> How did it work? Oh my gosh. It was heavy. The only way I can explain it, it's you throwing a bowling ball 50 miles an hour and you trying to stop it. Like that thing gets out sideways and it, there's no bringing it back. It just mm-hmm. bike wanted to keep going. Mm-hmm. So we go out and test. Both days, rain, mud. I suck in the mud. So we're trying to test in the mud, and it was horrible. Go to Spain to race. Um, I think I'm like 40th place, dead last. Can't ride the bike at all. And first moto, come out of a corner, and it's this big roller section, and I come out, and I start going through them, and the rain comes out like this and just hucks me head first into it the backside of one of the rollers fractured my C3. What? Yeah. Oh. Fractured my C3. So I take, they take me, I crash. I thought I broke my collarbone. My collarbone was killing me. Take me to ambulance ride, go to the hospital. They do all these x-rays and MRIs. Everything's fine. Doctor doesn't speak any English at all. Doctor comes in like 30 minutes later. Whoa. Pointing at his neck. Don't move. Don't. Pretty much tell me, don't move, don't move put me in a neck brace and they wanted me to stay for a couple of days and do stuff. Well, I had a flight that night to get out of there. So I'm like, I can't stay. I got to go. I got a flight to make. And they're like, no, 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 no. Finally, they bring me a piece of paper to sign. So sign the paper and go to my flight in a neck brace. And it wasn't bad. Yeah. It was just a little, not just a little, or anything, just fracture. Yeah. So it was fractured my neck. Was it hurting? Um, it was just sore. Okay. Yeah. So when you got home, you see a doctor? Uh, no. Never went to the doctor. Read it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think I took the neck brace off and just didn't ride a motorcycle. For Does it bug you at all? Airplane? No. Oh, okay. Yeah. No, I got lucky. So did, you didn't go back? No. 
for that anymore. One one and done on the Aprilia. Oh, it was horrible. Yeah, so it was just go do a couple of races, sign a contract for the next year to race the whole year and ride the bike. No way. I'm not putting myself through this. Yeah. If I had time on the bike to ride it, it I probably could get used to it a little bit. Still not be comfortable, but able to go race the thing. But not riding, only riding five times in a year or something, and then trying to go race a GP on a bike that... Yeah. It was the first time I wish I was on a Husky. And this is at the time Husky, the bikes weren't that good. You're praying for a KTM. I'm praying, just a Husky. Because <laughs> at the time, KTMs were good. Huskies, they, were, they right. weren't that great. Right. And I'm like, man, I wish I could have been on a Husky. <laughs> oh, man. So... That was that took you out twenty thousand ten. Yep. What did you do the following year? So you were supposed to go back, but I was just full time coaching. Okay. I was training. You started Lano MX or was this okay? Yeah. I actually started that I think in two thousand nine. I started training a little bit. Um I had quit my job with my ex girlfriend's dad, um, and just started doing full time training. Mm. Yeah. So I did that for two and a half years. You do you enjoy that? Like, pretty you love it. Yeah. So at the time when I quit to go become an electrician. Which was when? Uh, 2016. Okay. Yep. So from 2010 to 16, I coached and raced in 2012. Obviously, we'll get there. Um, but yeah, I was just not having fun on the dirt bike at all. I went to Paula one day and was not having fun at all. I was there with a the family and friends and. I'm like, man, I'm over this. I want to go do something different. Hmm. Yeah. So even even the coaching, you just didn't like being there, like that type of thing, or um, yeah, I was just kind of over everything. Yeah, yeah really. Mm -hmm. But being back now, man, I love it. Yeah, I'm having so much fun. Oh, sometimes you got to step away to kind of. You do. Yeah, you got to get away for away from it to realize how much. And the coaching is fun. I mean, I'd be curious to get your take on this. Obviously, I've done my share of it. Um, we have a coaching app, you know, Elevate that we started. Mm -hmm. But I, there's something about if if you find a writer who's coachable, who will listen to what you say yes. and and is good at going okay, and then going and putting it into practice yep. and seeing them improve. Yes. And there's something really neat about. It. There's nothing better. Yeah, yeah. I got a kid, Hudson Zebra, right now. He's made so much improvements in the last six months that I've been working with him, maybe four months. But yeah, there's nothing better than watching them progress like that. Yeah. And, and they got to listen. Yeah. You know? And some don't. Some don't. Conversely, don't. conversely, when you have a guy, you're like, hey, dude, you're doing this. You've got to stop this. Do this. Yes. Go, give me five laps over here. And they, they can't do it. They just can't do what you're asking them to yeah. do. It's like, well, it's like golf. They say it takes 2,000 golf swings to change your bad, to fix your bad habit and it to become natural. Ugh. So that would be 2,000 corners of getting your head up, getting your elbows up, you know? Like, it's hard to break back. So I'm never going to fix my golf habits. <laughs> 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 I'm, I'm never going to improve. You better get a Garmin approach and put it in the garage. I don't think I've swung 2,000 times in the last 10 years. Yeah. Um, yo. okay. So you're coaching for a couple of years. What was the 2012 comeback about? So, um, Mike Craig actually came up to me. He had this lady that was sponsoring a couple of his kids and he's like, Hey, you want to come race? You want to race in 2012? And I'm like, sure. And he wasn't there very long. Um, I don't know what happened there, but got in contact with this lady, um, then Matt Vera from Pro Circuit, I think he was an amateur team rider. We got in connection with them because Mitch was doing, I believe, my motors and all that stuff. So he became my team manager. Uh, uh, so we put this program together. I rode Supercross for two weeks before 2012. and I, But I was riding a little bit, yeah. going out to the hills with you guys. And yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. But I would ride maybe six times a year or something. Like yeah. I was just filming throwing whips um yeah two weeks before supercross start riding four or five days a week trying to put in those 15 lap motos to get in shape and how was this 450 getting on the cowie and you're in a little more familiar bike 
No, two in the Supercross. Oh, it's on a 250. Oh, okay. yes. It was a Honda 250F. Yeah. Okay. Did you do out or you did outdoors on a 450 though? Um, no, I don't think so. Yeah. Two now, that's why oh, shows. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. I filled in for Curly Designs. Oh, okay. Right. That's right. All the riders got hurt. So this Supercross season, you're on a 250. You had some, you had a couple of sevenths, a couple of eights, you know, lots of top tens. Yeah. Yeah. I was pretty much, my goal was just for the first couple of rounds, qualify, qualify for the main and then just work my way up and build my fitness. Mm. What did you notice different? So this would have been literally 10 years to the day from your first season. What was the difference? I mean, obviously it's all four strokes. Yes. What else did you notice that was different? Like how did it feel to have all the, as the bike wise? Just everything. Everything. Yeah. It was, well, the bike, obviously I didn't have testing. Honda, we would test a couple of days a week on yeah. suspension, motor work. So what I was riding, I thought was good, you know, um, which it was, the suspension wasn't. Okay. So when I did my fill-in ride for TLD for Vegas, I was like, wow. It's good. Good. <laughs> yeah. And just the motor, like my motor was really good. It was fast. But having a factory TLD bike and the gearing, it was so much smoother. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. You think it's good until you ride something else. You're all, oh, yeah. Oh, that's good. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Well, decent, like I said, decent season. Um, so it was before Vegas that TLD contacted you? Yep. I think at, um, I think I was running sixth in points going into Salt Lake maybe. Um, and then I believe Sealy had gotten hurt. And then there were, uh, I forget the other rider. He may have gotten hurt at Salt Lake City. Hmm. So that was around before Vegas. So they had nobody. And so team manager called me begging me to fill in and it was Tyler, right? Keith? Yeah. 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 Um, and then so what was the deal for the 450? Like, hey, come do Vegas and Christian Craig was hurt. Mm-hmm. So they're like, Hey, will you come do five rounds? And I hadn't ridden an outdoor race in a long time. Yeah. Two thousand eight. And you're just like, why not? Yeah. How was that 450? It was good. So I believe Pro Circuit was doing the suspension at the time. Um, and then we had Scott from Shoa do us a set. And man, I was literally probably five seconds a lap faster than mm-hmm. I'm doing that. Yeah, it was so good. One of the best suspension guys out there. Mm-hmm. He's the one that's doing my bike right now. Oh, is he? Yeah. Yeah, Scott Bennett's been around. Dude. For a long time. So good. Um, But yeah, went out, I think, in Colorado in the first practice, and I was fit fastest in practice. Yeah, super stoked. Yeah. (laughs) Um, Yeah, you did well there. You got ninth overall in Thunder Valley. Oh, man. And I was out of shape. You know outdoors. Yeah. You got to be in good shape. I was throwing up. I think I had um, altitude sickness. Someone came off, and they're like, I was throwing up everywhere, and it looked like dip, like chunks of dip. Huh. They're like, were you dipping when you were racing? I'm like, no, it was just blood and, and chunky blood and stuff. I mean, I was puking. I think Michael Lessie was behind me, and I was just pushing it the last two laps. I didn't want him to pass me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I came yeah. off the track, and as soon as I went over that finish line, just It's not good, man. No, that's not good. And did, I didn't did, the did a puke look like coffee grounds? Yes. Then? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, that's not great. And at the time, I didn't know. Yeah. But I looked it up later, and I think I had altitude sickness. Mm. Hmm. Yeah, that's not good. Crazy, man. So you do those fill-in rides, mm-hmm. and then so you're going in to, I did the five rounds with TLD, um, and then- they actually wanted to sign me for 2013, but I wanted to be loyal to the lady who forked out all the money from my bikes, everything. Um, we were looking into getting like a renegade semi and stuff, and I wanted to start my own team. Started was riding Supercross in October, November, getting ready, and felt great. I felt so good. Um, I'm like, this is going to be a really good year. Well, she ended up getting sick got pneumonia and almost died. So all the money stopped. And by then TLD had already signed someone else. Lost mm-hmm. that. Yeah. 
So you didn't even go racing that year? No, that was it. That was my last year racing. 2000. So did you kind of say, oh, all right, that's it, I'm done? Or were you kind of like, well, we'll just see what happens? Like, what, what was your mindset at that um, point? I was very frustrated and upset about it because I felt good. I was out there riding with Anderson and some of the top guys, and I was literally right there with them yeah. at the t- tracks. And um, I was really looking forward to it. And then when that happened, I was just very frustrated, but I'm like, you know what? God's got a purpose in this. Like I could have got hurt, you know, could have been injured or mm-hmm. something like that. So after a few weeks, it kind of, the anger went away and just kind of deal with it. And then what'd you do? Uh, back to coaching. Okay. Yeah. So that was 2012. Went back to full-time coaching until, um, no, I did some best whips in between there. Oh yeah. 2013. I was going to ask you about this. Um, was that the only time you did X Games? Was that your? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And what was that like? Because you- It was fun. I mean, this has been, your calling card has been your whips, you know, whether it's in the hills or yeah, finish line jumps or wherever. Yeah. So, and best whip, you got to do a little, a variety of different whips. Like I'm really good going upside down. Yeah. But doing the turn downs, and I don't know if the turn ups were anything then, but- I was so focused on not just doing my upside down whips that it jacked me up for the competition. I was trying to do my turn downs and it was get it over a little bit. It was nothing big. Mm-hmm. And my dad's like, why didn't you just stick to the upside down whips? So I'm like, I was trying to change it up, you know? Mm-hmm. So, but yeah, that was fun. There's some strategy to it. There is. Yeah. 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 Cause I think when Hanny won, all he had was that one dude upside down whip, you. which was insane. Yes. He didn't have, none of his others were like. Variety, yeah. Yeah. But you're right, because how many laps do you get or how many hits off the jump? Mm, maybe seven minutes okay. or five minutes. So probably five to ten jumps, right? You get quite a bit. Yeah. Yeah. And then My fans ten. fans voted. Yeah. yeah. It was all on Twitter, I think. Yeah. So if you had a big following on Twitter, that's yeah. how it worked. Back. Kind of a popularity contest. Yeah. Although, you know, like if you did throw a big crazy whip, people are going to vote for it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. For sure. How did that one go? How'd you end up? I don't even remember. Fifth out of six, I okay. think. Pretty fun experience, though. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So much fun. I uh, I did X Games three different times in Supermoto, and I just always remember thinking, man, this is so weird. It's like they pay you really well yeah. and take good care of you off camera, but it's such a made-for-TV event. Like, they would have us on the grid, and they go, like, tire warmers off. Okay, you know, get ready, get ready. Okay, wait, hold on. We're going to wait for commercial. And then you'd be sitting there for like seven minutes. Yeah. And then they come back. Okay. Oh, hold on. We're waiting. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's just like, dude, it is. Get us going here. You know, like you're just at their whim totally for TV. And I always looked at like the freestyle guys, like, oh, I could do freestyle. No problem. Like, I'm not starting with 20 or 40 guys going into a turn. Then getting into doing the best whip, the landing is straight up and down. If you come up short, you're done. Yeah, these guys are flipping double flips and tricks. I'm like, these guys are not. They are gnarly. You so, when you watch that stuff in person and what they've got to hit, yes, and the, the they've got to memorize the routine. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They they earned all that money. They earned it. <laughs> it's gnarly. Yes, I'm glad you agree with that. <laughs> I, I just I remember uh, remember the uh, in fact you. I don't know if you did this. It was called the Navy. Moto X World Championships or something. It was at San Diego at Qualcomm. You remember that? Uh-uh. It was like a spinoff. It wasn't run by X Games or uh, ESPN. It was somebody else. Anyway, uh, they did it just one year and then it went away. But they did a supermoto. You jumped down into the stadium, looped around some of the supercross track, and then came out of the tunnel. Um, but anyway, Twitch, they had a jump that went, I'm telling you, it was the length of the whole stadium. I don't know how far it was. And he was hitting it and doing a flip, and I just was like, "Yeah, that I've got that burned into my brain." How far he went? Yeah, easily a hundred feet plus, upside down or net, no footer, what you know, like just twitch, Deegan, Feist, they're not right in the head. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're crazy. All right, so you got back into your training, um, and did that for what a couple more years, right? Yep, 2012 to 2016. Okay. 
Yeah, and it was going good. I, I was, was that consistent work? Like that's the one thing about coaching. That's me, a tough thing. It kind of comes and goes. It huh? It's very, very tough to make a good living at it. Yeah, because sometimes you're like, oh man, I got all these guys, and then hey, I this kid got hurt. He just uh, he doesn't want to train anymore. He went somewhere else, yeah. and all of a sudden you're like, dude, it is. I got to draw up some business. Yeah, yeah. At the time, I was doing good. Um, Toyota of Escondido was giving me a Tundra every year. Escondido Cycle Center was giving me a bike, but. I was just so over it. Plus, I wanted to do something what so I could fall back on it, mm -hmm. you know? Because all I know is racing. Yeah. I can't go do anything else. So this is this is really, really tough for a lot of guys in our sport to be able to do like what you did. Just say, okay, I'm walking away from all this completely. And I'm going to go do something totally new. Yeah. I did do that with the fire service and it was scary. Yeah. Like you... Man, you're putting yourself out there. Yeah. And you're starting at the very bottom. Very bottom. Most of the kids you're, that I got kind of came up through with, they're 22, 23. I'm like 30 year old. I'm an old man. Yeah. And um, getting screamed at. And I know. It's just hard. It's hard. But, um, you know, you do what you got to do. Like, I just want something stable. Yeah. Right. And I imagine that's something you could relate to. Like, racing, it was just year after year. I got to get these results to get a job. And every year you're fighting for a ride, it seemed like. Yeah. I think I only had one contract that was two years. Mm -hmm. Maybe maybe two. So every year you're fighting for a job and it's like, I just wanted some security. Just something that I knew was there yeah. day after day. So that was a big part of what I liked about the fire service. And I wanted to do something a little more significant than just say, oh, I just rode dirt bikes. Yeah. I don't know. It seemed like as you start to look at your legacy. Yeah. Like, what did you do? Yeah. I rode dirt bike. And I, <laughs> all right. You then. I want to do something more. So t how did the electrician thing come about? Yeah. I was just, one day I was looking at the construction trades and my dad was an operator. My brother's an operator. I was, well, did That didn't interest you? I was sick of the dirt. Mm. Sick of the dirt. Hated being, I was at the tracks all the, the time. Smell of it would... Yeah. I was just, I was over the dirt, the motorcycles, the coaching. So I look into um, the electrical stuff and I'm like, man, it looks easy on the body. A lot of thinking going on, calculations and stuff. And um, I'm like, oh, you know what? I'm going to try it. Not thinking I had to wear a vest, a hard hat. I had no idea what I was getting myself into. And my first day on the job, I was like, whoa. Woke up 2.30 in the morning. Had to be, I was living here in Temecula. Had to be in... in um, uh, Palm Springs at 5 a.m. or there at 4.30 to start at 5. So, is this for an apprenticeship or for yeah. school? No, oh, this okay. is for apprenticeship. This okay. is my first job. So I'm sleeping in till 8, 9 o'clock, go to the tracks or whatever to waking up at 2.30 in the morning. Like, it was a rude awakening. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it was tough. And you know, as a racer, everything's handed to you. You're always getting praise and all that stuff. You're on a high pedestal. Yeah. And then now I'm doing electrical. I'm new. I'm picking up the trash, getting coffees, weeping. Yeah. I'm being told what to do. It was a very humbling experience. Yeah. A very humbling experience. So take but, good. Yeah. How did it go? So take me. Yeah. It was was it one year uh, internship or what was it? No, four. Oh, four or five. Yeah. So I had to do schooling, online schooling for um, four years, four and a half years. Oh. Yeah. Okay. And so. So you didn't have to go to any kind of like a lineman school or something like that prior to? Not prior, no. Okay. So you get your on-job experience and then either after work, you go to school twice a week for two hours, okay. two and a half hours, or they have an online program. Okay. Which that's what I did. Okay. I'd just be sitting on the couch after work for two hours and then take a test. Yeah. So I did that for. And so what is, you're coming out of it with what, uh, certificate? Like what is it? Uh, um, general electrician. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Huh. General electrician. And so you got that. Mm hmm. And did you get a job anywhere working as an electrician? Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I work for Berg Electric. It's a okay. big company nationwide. Okay. I think they have like 3000 employees. Um, Awesome company, treated me very well. Um, but yeah, I worked with them for six years, and then okay. So this must be where you kind of disappeared, huh? Because like I said, I I just stopped seeing you around. Like, yeah, I feel like I went 
six yeah. or seven years without seeing you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It was about six, seven years. Um, yeah, you know how it is. You have a family, get married. We don't have kids, but um, you have a normal job, waking up super early in the morning from 2.30 to 4.30 in the morning every day. You get home from work, hang out with family a little bit. I love my sleep, so I go to bed at 6.30, 7 o'clock every night, mm. and it was just work, man. The weekends, I really didn't want to do nothing. I wanted to chill yeah. and relax. So are you, you're not still doing this? No, no. So I got a call um, from a guy, Ryan Zebra, and he's like, hey, we need you. Um, we want you to come coach my kid. And so he's paying me really good money to train his kid. So you, you quit with this Berg? Yep. But you could, something you could pick back up in it? Oh, yeah, absolutely. There's always electrical work. Do electricians yeah. make good money. Yeah. And I do side work on the side now. So I'm not working for Berg anymore. I went to full-time coaching and um, and then just doing little side jobs here and there okay. for extra money. I got to go get my C10 license so I can start my own my own business. And yeah. Sweet. Is that what you think you'll do? I mean, do you have a plan long-term with it? Um, I'm hoping that I could just build my clientele up for my training, you know, and do that full-time. Okay. Um, but if not, just roping houses and putting in panels. Little stuff like that. Mm. Well, I'm going to call you because I got a lot of electrical <laughs> work needs done. So that's good to know. Yeah. Um, so was there any kind of drama? I, I thought I remember hearing something. I just wanted to ask you about this. With you and your dad, did you guys like have a falling out at some point? My dad, no? never. Never? No. Okay. I must be thinking of someone else. Okay. No. Um, no, me and my dad, we were good my whole career. He was really hard on me. Once I started performing... Like in the B class, going into the A class, like I won the three out of four at Vegas. And I didn't win the fourth one. I think I got second. And dude, he was so mad at me. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. He was. But he was hard on me. But as soon as I got into Supercross, he became a softy. He just stepped he back. Never pushed me. Yeah. Okay. Never pushed me hard. Yeah, I kind of liked it. Yeah, you know, to a point being pushed, but well, I feel like you have, you know, sometimes you have to as a parent. You, you kind of feel like, okay, they're being soft or they're whatever it is. I need to push them. But then I, always, my dad did the same thing when I signed with Mitch. He's like, all right, I don't know, you know, he knows way more than I do, so I'll, I'll be up in the stands drinking yeah. beer. If you need me, you yeah. know. And I, I like that it is. to a degree, but uh, plus, I just think he saw like how dangerous it was hitting these triples and these whoops yeah. and there was so much risk. Well, and you've probably finally surpassed where he got. So he's yeah. like, good job. <laughs> well, he would, he wanted to race pro, you know, but he yeah. never, never had the race experience. Like yeah. that was his goal as a kid. Yeah. And like mine, that's all I wanted to do. Yeah. Right. I love riding dirt bikes. And nowadays, like the kids have to love it. Most of the parents do it. Because the parents love it, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah. And the kid, that's all he, that should be all he wants is to be a professional motorcycle racer. And that's what it takes. Yeah. It's interesting because like even with my two kids, one of them is more competitive than the other. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I can tell right now which one has the potential. They both play soccer on a competitive travel team, mm -hmm. but I can already tell which one is going to peter out yeah. and which one has the potential to take it as far as she wants. Yeah. You either have that competitive drive and the passion for it. Mm -hmm. Like one of them will just be kicking around the ball around the house. Yeah. Kicking the ball against the couch over and over. And boom, boom, you know, and the other one, she's on her phone. Like, do you know what I mean? You just see it. This one has a passion for it. This one doesn't. Yeah. It's no different with dirt bikes, right? Yeah. You're right. A kid has to just love it. It's all he can think about. Yeah. And it's crazy now. I mean, it, it was like that when I was growing up too, the parents, but the parents push these kids so hard. I see it on mini bikes. The kid has no bike control at all, but the parents want him jumping a 50 foot tabletop or 40 foot tabletop mm -hmm. in the night. He's not ready for it. Mm -hmm. Like, and some guys, some guys perform early and then some are later. Yeah. You know, some are church later. Yeah. Like my first national, I was 13 or 14 before my very first national. And it took me till I was 15 or 16 to start moving yeah. up. I wasn't a Michael Lessie 
Mike right. Lessie, you know, or uh, Ryder D. Francisco. These kids were so gnarly on little bikes. Yeah. looked like a little pros. For me, it was, I had to hit puberty. Mm-hmm. The minute I hit puberty, that testosterone is what I was missing. Yeah. Right. And I don't know how some of these little kids like Ricky James, uh, Wyndham, like these kids that from the time they were little just yeah. won. Yeah. Um, which is impressive. They're rare, right? Like that's pretty rare. Yeah. 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 And that's impressive for them just to jump on a bike and start dominating right away. Yeah. It's a gift. What do you, um, what is kind of your main thing you work on with families? And I get this a lot, like, well, what do I need to do for little, you know, Johnny? And, you know, and I just say, Hey, look, work on the foundational stuff Yeah, because you have to build a good foundation, right? It's just like building a house. If it's janky, the whole thing's coming down, Mm -hmm. right? You're going to get hurt as he tries to build higher. Um, But I tell him this, like, just enjoy spending time with your kid. Yeah. This is what you're doing and work hard. Use it to teach them those lessons of like, you know, the values of hard work and discipline. But man, don't look at this through the eyes of, okay, how do I get them to be a pro? Yeah. Just enjoy the time you're spending at the track because that you'll never regret. Yeah. Um, it's bonding time with the family. And I'm sure you're the same way. Like my, um, cause my dad doesn't live, he lives in Phoenix. So like all of our memories that I have of him are going to the races, hanging out at the races, yeah. traveling. That's our whole relationship. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we still talk about it, right? Like, so I tell parents, you'll never regret that. You'll never regret spending that time, that money. But if you make the focus, okay, I got to get him to be a pro. Yeah. Then you're, you're saddling him with pressure. There's a, uh, feeling of never accomplishing what you set out to if it doesn't work. Yeah. Just appreciate spending time with your kid and your family, hopefully all of them. Yeah. And if the outcome is he does something with it. Exactly. Awesome. Yeah. Right. That's what I tell him. You got to be patient. Like I was saying, some kids mature earlier or later, you know, it's a great bonding for the family going out to the races, camping out, hanging out. Um, but we go out, work on technique. We put in our motos, our sprints, but enjoy it, you know? A lot of these kids are seven, eight, nine years old. They're already in the gym four or five days a week. I know. They just need to ride their motorcycle. Yeah. I don't think until you're 14, 13, 14, 15, then start doing the training, but just go ride and enjoy the bike. And very few people make it in Supercross, especially making money, Yeah, you know? Very few. Yeah. Do it. And if if you have the money to do it, just go do it for fun. Work hard, put in the work, put in the effort. And then if he can qualify for a main event or start racing supercross outdoors, great. You know. Yeah. What uh, I feel like nobody goes out, you know, like our era in the nineties, especially, when it rained, in the hills. no one was going to a track. It was let's go to the hills, let's yeah. go out and make a track or make some jumps. Guys just don't hardly do that anymore. And if they do, uh, you know, like it rained and I, I invited a couple of guys out. I won't say who, but current factory guys. And they were out there going, okay, I'm going to do a 12 minute session. I'm going to do a 14 minute. And I'm like, well, why don't you just like ride? Like, let's just, I don't know. It seems so structured. It took all the fun out of it. Yeah. That's how it is nowadays. Yeah. Kids don't go out and go play ride and have fun. I think our generation, like, Mike Craig was probably the starter of going out to Palm Avenue and and Twitch and stuff, hitting cliff jumps. And then I was a, I was younger, so I'd always look up to those guys and then go out to Palm and hit those cliff jumps. And then, man, 2004 and five, I was going out to Beaumont and hitting jumps and yeah. throwing whips. like. And you learn bike control that way. Totally. Just hitting little cliff jumps yeah. where the bike kicks and you're learning how to control it and... Yeah. We learned so much bike control. Well, and and like we've talked about being comfortable on your bike, that comes with a lot of seat time. That comes with mm-hmm. making it do things that yeah. a track doesn't really ask of you. Yeah. But hey, we're going to hit this wall. We're going to land over here. Mm-hmm. Ooh, okay. <laughs> so I need to do this. You know, yep. this is what I need to do to make my bike go here. Yep. Um, what's your, what's some of your favorite days out in the hills? I, I remember a day we had, it was probably in that 05, 06 area. It was on the far east end of Beaumont, mm-hmm. and we had one. You'd come at like fifth gear pin, and it was like a big whip to the right. And yeah, down. do you remember that? Huh? That was like one of the coolest, sketchiest jumps ever. 
So much fun. So much fun. That there were so many jumps out there. I think the last one was around 2011. We did the Racer X film. Mm -hmm. That one jump over the hill. Yeah. Oh my God. So much fun. Yeah, I couldn't hit that like you were. You were I guess upside so down. Much fun. Yeah. You were on a Cowie huh? Mm -hmm. yeah, I remember that. Yeah. Yeah, but that same area, we had a lot of fun jumps. Oh, yeah. Those were such fun days. And you got to do that. You got to be serious. You got to put in your motos, your training, but also have fun with it. Or you're just going to get burnt out. Yeah. You know, unless you're winning, then you, maybe you won't get burnt out. But if you're normal, like most of us get injured and start from ground zero, like yeah. you just got to have fun with it. Well, this is something that, that goes right along with that. I, I say this all the time, like most kids that make it to the pro ranks did some winning at the amateur level, mm -hmm. right? And they were their fastest local guy. Yeah. Right. You want to brought up probably every weekend, right? No, no, no. Okay. You're shooting a hole in my theory. <laughs> you did some winning though. I got to believe, right? <laughs> Once you move up to the pro class, how much do you win? Yeah. Most guys, it's like never or very seldom, yeah. you know, because all the winning is usually done by a hand few, handful yeah. of people. Mm -hmm. And so you go from winning a lot at your local level, maybe you win occasionally at the amateur national level, to going years without winning. Yeah. And that starts to beat you up and it starts to become not fun, right? I mean, we're all racing to win. Yeah. Podiums are cool. But winning, man, that's the pinnacle. Podiums are huge. Huge, huge, you know. But when you're at that that competitive edge where you know you can win, you want to win. But looking back now, dude, podiums are oh, great. <laughs> I tried my best to appreciate all of them. But after you've had a couple seconds yep. and you've never won, you're like, yo. <laughs> a second starts to be like, okay, cool, but yep. man, I really want to win. Yep. You know, It's hard because you go through the motions. You struggle one weekend, you get 10. Then- you go get the podium. You're super stoked. Get another podium. You're happy. Then the next race, you get six, and you're all pissed off. Yeah. Or maybe you're pissed off on the second podium. Yeah. And you're like, well, maybe I need to. Maybe I should have been away that. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm six, not on the podium. Like, <laughs> I tell guys all the time, like, hey man, appreciate it. Yeah. You never know when it's the last time you're up on that box. Now, for whatever reason, you're only as good as your last race. Unfortunate, man. Man. Um. You got married. Who did you marry? Like, when did this happen? Um, five years ago. Juliana Lumberg. Okay. Yeah. So. How'd you meet her? Um, we grew up together. We went to kindergarten or first grade together. Um, we had mutual friends. Okay. Never really hung out in high school or nothing. Um, and she popped up on my Facebook one day in 2015. I'm like, oh, I want to see how she's doing and wrote her a little message. And from there, we've been together. Huh. Yeah. Maybe have been together for eight years and coming on five years nice yeah the internet wins again again connect Dan <laughs> facebook man it's caused a lot of marriages <laughs> and divorces uh, yes <laughs> that is true so no kids is, is that on purpose or you guys just wait um no we uh my testosterone levels are low so it doesn't help but my wife she just can't produce the eggs mm. so we did ivf twice a couple years ago and no luck there. Egg la the eggs lasted like three days, and then the second time was one day. Mm. So we're working on it, working on our bodies, get them healthier and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Still have hope, but I'm 40 now. She's 38. Mm. So we're getting at that age, but mm. if not, adoption. Yeah, you guys consider that? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Um, hmm. Is there anything else inside the sport or outside that you'd want to do that you have like man i'd like to do that um like yeah. any industry jobs other than coaching thing i don't know i don't think i would want to do work i don't know maybe a team manager position maybe or a riding coach position i don't know i, I love coaching it's your own time yeah you know um it sucks when you're back to traveling every weekend, though. Yeah. Don't get me wrong. I love getting on a plane every weekend when I was racing. I love the traveling and stuff, but to do that every weekend now, that's tough. Tough. It's hard on marriages. When you have kids. Like, It's really hard. Mm -hmm. You got to have the right person to do that. Um, Anything outside the sport? Like, do you, do you, how serious are you about starting your own electrical business? Um, I'm working on it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's where 
I'm going to make my money. Yeah. Really. Mm -hmm. You know, you can make a good living at coaching, but like we're saying, it's, it's up and down. Yeah. Really good months. When you can always do it on the side, you know? Yeah. 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 I'm loving it. Being back on the bike, working with the kids. And I was talking about racing next year. I'm serious. Oh, you are serious? I'm serious. Yeah. I already got a call into Star Yamaha to see how much it would cost to lease a couple bikes. Yep. All right. Just super I don't think cross. anyone's qualified for a main event in Supercross at 40. Do you know? I know Dowdy. Yeah, Dowdy. I don't know. I'd have to go back. How old was Reed? 37. Mm -hmm. 38. Yeah. So have you, are you still riding any Supercross? No. This just popped in my head a couple weeks ago. Yeah. But just being back on the bike, I'm healthy. I haven't been riding. You still have that sports psychologist number? No. <laughs> I need it. Maybe get her to yeah. talk you out of it. <laughs> yeah. Do I also feel like I'll be, I'll work. mentally, I'm like, I could still do it. I don't know if I can do it at 40, but just being on the bike and riding. Yeah. I feel good. Get on the bike. I got six months of riding and training. Like, I'll wear a Team Lano shirt at A1, dude. Yeah. You just tell me. All right. <laughs> um, well, we ask all of our guests this final question, and it's... Um, sort of just a legacy question is how do you want to be remembered in this sport? Really just, I was good with my fans without our fans. We're nothing. Yeah. They're not out buying bikes and gear and stuff like that. Um, it was always the last one to be signing autographs. I always love my fans. Mm -hmm. And so I'm sure there's some bad stories of me being mean maybe, but, um, just really, really good to the fans. Yeah. That's what I want to be. You always were good. You're always nice to everybody. Yeah. Yeah. I always uh, appreciated that. You had a good, healthy respect for, you know, what that meant. Yeah. Because you, and look, I probably, I know I'm guilty of it because I've had people say that I was rude to them at some point. I'm like, really? Man, it bums me out. But it's like, I always tell people, look, this is a, was a once in a lifetime opportunity for you to see your favorite rider. Yeah. It's just another Saturday night to them. They're doing this year after year, weekend after weekend. So, and remember they're at work. Exactly. It's, it's totally different. It's hard. Throughout the races, these guys are focused and they're not focused on the fans, you know? Yeah. I was more as a racer. I always wanted to be nice to my fans. I always wanted to make everybody happy. Um, should I have been different? Maybe, you know? But I think you can be nice to a point, and then once you put that helmet on, it's go. I always tried to be nice to all the pretty ladies. <laughs> that was my. I'm right with you. And then I got married and retired. Yeah. Uh, Do you remember when we went to Canada, downhilling? Whistler, Whistler. Um, did Lopes? So much fun. Yeah. Lopes took us around. Yeah, downhill. That's right. It's so much fun, dude. That was amazing. Uh, if you've never mountain bike in Whistler, if you're a mountain bike fan, no place like it. Yeah. Incredible, incredible. Well, listen, dude, you're such a stud. I always appreciate you. Uh, anytime I see you, I just makes me smile. So I'm glad to see you back on a bike. Uh, where can people get a hold of you if they want to do some training? Um, Lano MX. Instagram, Billy Leninovich. I have a website. I'm working on a new one right now, but okay. I know mx.com or Billy Leninovich.com. Okay. Um, super old. It's been the same for 10 years, but, or if you need some electrical work locally here in San Diego, I'm going to, I'm going to be getting your card. Yep. Uh, well, thanks for taking the time to come in. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Back. Love having you on. Stay tuned. We'll be back to wrap up the show. I want to be back. Hey folks, thanks for tuning in today. We appreciate Billy Leninich taking the time to come in. Uh, I've known him a long time, like I like I said in the show. One of the nicest guys you'll ever meet. Just very unassuming, very friendly, very humble, uh, and incredibly talented, man. You ever get a chance to watch him hit a ramp and throw down some whips, It's um, it'll make the hair in the back of your neck stand up. It's pretty impressive. So uh, great story. Appreciate him taking the time. As always, please support our sponsors if you get an opportunity. Um, we, we do take a lot of time and effort making sure we are selecting very carefully who we partner with so that we're not promoting garbage. Uh, and if they are on this board behind me, if there's somebody that support this show, their products are absolutely elite level. So uh, whether that's Yamaha, which makes 
the best motorcycles right now you can buy off-road street doesn't matter method race wheels troyly designs pro circuit these are all the absolute highest level so uh, check them out start there if you need any of those products uh dunlop nihilo concepts pro x stasic flow vision motul seat concepts uh you know skda these guys are all amazing partners and we're stoked to have them on board thank you guys for watching we appreciate your support we'll see you in a couple weeks the whiskey throttle show is brought to you by yamaha Join the Blue Crew today and take advantage of all that Yamaha has to offer, including amateur racing trackside support, Jason Rain's demos and instructional classes, and frankly, the most high-performing motorcycles available on the market today. Whether you're looking for a four-stroke, a two-stroke, a side-by-side, -side, a quad, a boat, a generator, Yamaha prides themselves on absolute top-level quality and reliability. Rev your heart with Yamaha and join the Blue Crew today. Method Race Wheels, bringing you the lightest, strongest, fastest wheels in off-road for your truck, van, sprinter, UTV, or SUV. They've been dominating the Baja 500 and 1000 and every major off-road event around the world for years with high quality and performance. They also look amazing. They come in a bunch of different styles and colors for your rig, so check them out. You can get 20% off a set of wheels using our code Whiskey Throttle. No capitals, no spaces. 20% off using our code. Check them out. Troy Lee Designs is the leader in off-road motocross apparel and style. So whether you're looking for a cool new paint job for your helmet, maybe your name and number on your helmet lettered on, you're looking for new gear, you're looking for mountain bike gear, off-road gear. They've got the brand new Scout line and GP and SE models. Troy Lee Designs has it all. They've been leading this industry for decades, and they're going to continue to do it. Check out TroyLeeDesigns.com. SKDA is a moto graphics and seat covers company with several offices based around the globe. For too long, bikes and graphics have all looked the same. They just start to blend together. SKDA is working to change that. With super clean and unique design work, a bike with SKDA graphics stands out in a crowd and adds a touch of art to the world of moto. Hey, we need that. SKDA prides itself on providing premium customer service both before and after the sale is made. Visit SKDA online to view the current product range and get in touch with their team to get your bike refreshed. I want to just make a, a mention here that these guys, not only is their design way outside the box, very, very cool. They'll work with you on custom things. The, the products are incredible, okay? They'll speak for themselves. But what's really awesome, and you'll notice this the minute you order one of these, man, they give you an email saying, hey, the product's been shipped. Uh, hey, the product is here. It landed in this spot. Hey, it's coming today. Hey, your product's been delivered. They, they're just so good about staying in touch with you and letting you know where it's at. Customer service is 100%, and uh, that's just something that's rare these days. Check out SKDA. Here at the Whiskey Throttle Show, we're all about supporting brands that support our sport. And there's one tire company that has never walked away from the sport of motocross and supercross, and it's Dunlop. When times got tough and the economy took a crash, Dunlop stepped up and stayed with our sport to support it and the athletes and individuals that love it. Their MX-53 line and MX-33 lines absolutely dominate this sport. Every national championship at the pro level has been won in the last decade, and nearly every single amateur national championship at Loretta Lynn's has been won on a Dunlop. So if you're looking for high performance, you're looking for amazing quality, and you're looking to support a brand that never turns its back on our sport, there's only one choice for you, and it's Dunlop. Pro Circuit is the leader in aftermarket performance and quality. Whether you're looking for a little more horsepower out of your engine, some quality hard parts to improve the way your bike feels and looks, better handling through suspension or linkage or linkage arms, Pro Circuit is where you need to stop. It's your one-stop shop. You can go in there and get everything you need to make your motorcycle go from average to exceptional. Pro Circuit's got enough number one plates on their wall to side an entire home, and there's a reason for that. They're very, very good at what they do. Uh, the highest quality products with one goal in mind, and that's winning. Check out ProCircuit.com. Nihilo Concepts is leading the way in aftermarket hard parts. With their secondary on-switch device, something that was much needed in this sport, they've been innovating and bringing new products to market. Their latest is the new Nihilo Run-Cool Brake Pistons. They're designed to be stronger than stock and provide exceptional cooling performance with less brake drag. Most OEM caliper pistons are made from aluminum that just can't hold up to the heat and extreme demands of serious racing. When they get hot, the aluminum will distort, causing loss of hydraulic pressure and brake failure. Nihilo's run-cool pistons limit the area that boiling hot hydraulic fluid is able to come in contact with the piston, leaving two-thirds of the piston volume in open air 
with breather holes to enhance the cooling ability. It's made of a proprietary stainless blend, which is better at dissipating heat. You have issues with brake fade or brake failure, check out Nihilo Concepts among their many amazing hard parts and carbon fiber parts and titanium. Nihiloconcepts.com. Seat Concepts is the leader in motorcycle saddles. If you're looking for a new cover or a new seat entirely, Seat Concepts is the place to go. They make custom seat foams catered to your height, weight, riding ability, riding type. They also have waterproof covers and, and foams that will not break down if you ride in a lot of inclement weather. And they pride themselves on being much more comfortable than OEM or any other aftermarket company. If you're looking for a new seat or a new cover, Seat Concepts, there's nothing better. Need to replace something on your bike that's worn out? Look no further than Pro-X. These guys aim to make everything OEM quality or better at an affordable price. And they've also got some new products coming. So right now, chains, sprockets, anything inside the, in the engine internally, air filters. If it wears out, Pro-X makes it, and they make it at a quality level that's OEM or better. And they've got some new things coming that are awesome. A complete engine rebuild kits for the Polaris RZR 800s, Need to replace something on your bike that's worn out? Look no further than Pro-X. These guys aim to make everything OEM quality or better at an affordable price. And they've also got some new products coming. So right now, chains, sprockets, anything inside the, in the engine internally, air filters. If it wears out, Pro-X makes it, and they make it at a quality level that's OEM or better. And they've got some new things coming that are awesome. A complete engine rebuild kits for the... If you've got a little Grom that's looking to get started in the motorcycle world, the best way to get them going is on a Stasic bike. They've got multiple sizes, so from your very young Groms to those who are a little more grown up, you can start them safely. They've got controls that allow you to control the speed so he can't get going too quick. They can touch the ground. There's not a lot of noise to distract them. It's the perfect way to get your child involved in motorcycling at a very young age. And if you've got a kid who's already out ripping, there's series popping up all over. For those of you in Southern California, go to www.ameminicross.com and join their local series. If you're outside of this state, contact your local track and ask them about starting a Stasic class at your local track. Get over to Stasic.com and check out all they've got going on. Motul USA, uh, we, we lean hard on these lubricants to keep us uh, on the track and on the trail. And Motul has proven their quality over and over, uh, most recently with their Dakar win with Ricky Brabeck. Uh, they're sponsoring Supercross teams. They're diving into our sport again full full throttle, and uh, we're stoked to have them on board. Amazing products, top to bottom. Motul USA, go check them out. And finally, last but not least, Specialized Bicycles. If you are in the market to start pedaling, this is where you want to start. Uh, they've got great entry-level bikes all the way up to the Cadillac, the new Levo um, e-bike, uh, any, anything in between, man. It doesn't matter what kind of riding you're doing. Go check out and start with Specialized. Don't waste your time on something that's going to break. The derailleur's not going to shift after a couple months. Get something quality. Uh, these guys make it. Specialized leads that industry. Thanks for watching and listening to the Whiskey Throttle Show. Be sure to like and subscribe to get notified when new shows go up. And be sure to follow us on Instagram and TikTok. And visit whiskeythrottlemedia.com for additional content.